I'm going live now, Edit, and I'll just do a little bit warm up for a couple of minutes. And then I won't, am I, in, am I going to be on Yeah, screen? I'm just going to um, talk, introduce the, um, and I'll hand over to you in a minute or two. You starting early? Uh, no, I'm just, it, just a couple minutes before just to talk. Oh, okay. Like, got welcome it. Welcome back. Um, got it, got it, got it. No worries. And uh, yes, with that in mind, welcome back everyone to the afternoon session, uh, session two of our third annual Reddit Robotics Showcase. Um, uh, it's really, I really like this next category. It's always good to see um, the social, domestic and hobbyist robots, the kind of things that people are building at home or you're able to do no with uh, just a 3D printer and basic parts. It's really um, exciting. And the keynote speak we have for today's session has software that is very much um, well attuned to that kind okay. of case to make it easier um, to design and build and program robots um, at home and well in all kinds of contexts but I will let them talk more about it so uh, with that in mind um, I'm going to welcome our keynote speaker for our second session Elliot Horowitz the CEO of Viam and he's going to be giving us the presentation, The Era of Robotics Unicorns. So when you're ready. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, afternoon session. So I'm Elliot Horowitz. I am the CEO and founder of VM. And I figured I'd start a little bit with how I got into robotics in the first place and a little bit about myself. So first and foremost, I have been a technologist and an engineer for, for my whole life for many reasons, including that I am generally an impatient person and technology and software has the ability to give immediate gratification in many applications which for someone like me who really likes immediate gratification works really well. So I'm a little bit impatient. So a little bit of my background. So in college, a very long time ago, I did do some robotics, not a huge amount, but I, the best part of my robotics experience in college was having this very large robot that was probably about five feet tall and weighed 200 pounds, you know, so it's yay and big. And um, I used to work on navigation and I was sitting in the hallway outside of the lab, driving it around, and I put my watch down to do some typing, and it rolled over my watch and completely crushed it. So that was the highlight of my uh, college robotics career. And given that, I left robotics for a very long time. I started MongoDB back in 2007 and was the CTO at Mongo for 13 years. And in March of 2020, having nothing to do with COVID, I ended up leaving Mongo and started trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. So I started looking at really big problems, right? I started thinking about climate change and cleaning oceans and, you know, things like cleaning up forests and forestation because, well, one, we want more trees and two, we don't really want wildfires. Certainly for anyone who lives in the Northeast this week has not been a good week for wildfires. So I started trying to figure out how to solve any of these problems. So I looked at climate change first. And climate change really comes down to a couple of key things, right? One is generating power and two is cleaning up carbon. So I looked at generating power. I bought a nuclear physics textbook. I decided I was too old and not smart enough to figure it out. So I said, great, let's move on to carbon sinking. And then I was like, cool, let's just plant a trillion trees. Let's build kelp farms. Let's do all these things. Then I was also looking at oceans and oceans cleanup. And if you go online, you can find about six different robots, you know, six different prototypes of robots that clean oceans, bays, rivers, what have you. And yet I have never seen one in production. That like, you know, I live in New York City. There is no robot that wanders the Hudson River cleaning it. And it needs it. Like it'd be great. So couple of things that, you know, jump out at you. One is all these problems at the end of the day are labor, right? There aren't enough people or people aren't willing to, or it's too dangerous or too out of the way for humans to go and solve these problems and go work on these problems. Second is technology has not really solved them yet either, right? In theory, there could be robots doing these things, but they just don't exist. 
So started looking at the reasons why, right? What is going on? Why aren't there robots solving climate change, cleaning oceans, or frankly, cleaning up after my kids? Like they just don't exist. So why not? So I bought a UR5. It's actually, I think it's the one right behind me and put it in my living room and tried to make it play chess against me. So it turns out the chess part of this was really straightforward, right? There's lots of open source chess programs. Um, all of that worked great and it has worked great for a very long time. The robotics portion was interesting. So the arm itself, right? This UR5 that I've got behind me, it's great. The hardware is really cool, works really well. It's fine. It's a little expensive. We'll come back to that later. But fundamentally, the hardware works well. So then I tried to program it, and programming it was, let's just say, not fun. And it wasn't even sort of the complex robotics portion. It wasn't like motion planning. It wasn't anything that interesting from an actual science standpoint or a computer science standpoint or even a robotic standpoint. It was just the, hey, I've got an arm and I want it to move that way. It was just really hard to make it do anything useful. So I was like, okay, great. Let's go work on that problem. And some people might wonder, cool, you worked on databases for 13 years. Why go start a robotics company? Why go try to solve robotics? And at the end of the day, one of the really interesting things is that all the problems we solved at MongoDB, once you get just above the technology layer, are exactly the same. Right? How do you enable lots of engineers to work on a problem? How do you bring cutting edge science and really cool technology into the hands of millions of engineers so they can actually go solve real problems? So a lot of actual similarities. So now we're in the late 2020 and we're like, cool, we're gonna go and try to fix robots, fix robotics. How do we do it? So we spent about six months trying to figure out if there's a small way to get into the space. Right? What's going on? How do we do it? And turns out we couldn't figure it out. We were like, there's nothing we could do here. And this is interesting because if you think about the last 20 years, it feels like every year someone gets on stage somewhere, maybe it's Sony at a big presentation or who knows, and they say, hey, here's a robot. And just any day now, there's going to be robots cleaning your living, your living room. Rosie from the Jetsons is almost here, right? That's been what people have been saying for a long time. And yet, I don't see Rosie anywhere. So why not? Well, the big problem is that trying to solve anything small in robotics doesn't work, right? You can see dozens of companies over the last decade that have tried to solve small problems, build small platforms, a lot of them fail, a lot of them turn into toys or STEM programs or educational systems or maybe niche products. But it's been really hard to actually go and build a real platform to make it easy for people to build robots. So that's what we set out to do. We're like, we're gonna go build a software platform that works for every engineer who wants to go build robots. Right. And not prototypes, not research projects, but people who actually want to build robots, turn them into real businesses, scale them to hundreds, thousands, millions of robots doing practical, useful things in the real world, and then move on and iterate quickly and do more and more interesting things. You know, one way to think about it is if you go back 25 years, think about how hard it was to build a e-commerce website, right? You had to rack servers and buy hardware. Well, you first have to buy the hardware, then you can rack it. But then you get a, you know, it probably takes you $2 million to get an e-commerce store off the ground 25 years ago. And now it takes 20 bucks in 20 minutes, right? Go to Shopify, go to Squarespace, click a few buttons and you got a website and you can start charging credit cards and start doing cool things. How do we do that in robotics? Now, obviously this hardware and this thing, it's a little bit different, but fundamentally let's make it a hundred times easier to make robots successful. So how do we do that? Like what actually matters? What are the things that matter for a software company, right? If we say we're gonna go and make a software platform that actually works for robotics companies, what does that actually mean? So first, it's very important that 
any hardware works. We don't care. Whatever arm you have, whatever motor you have, camera, servo, sensor, any piece of hardware should be incredibly easy to integrate into the system, right? You still got to do something, but that something should be as trivial as absolutely possible. So now let's talk about building a robot. So the first thing that you have to do, obviously, is start assembling hardware. You need to pick a motor and pick an arm or pick a camera, do something, right? Get something. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a base. Maybe it's something that's like a rover. We've got a intermode rover in the back over there, that, that black one back there. You're buying some piece of hardware. You've got to integrate it. So what do you want to do? Well, in VM, you assemble the pieces of the hardware, whether assembled into a robot or just pieces on a desk. And then in a UI, you can just go and configure what you have. You're like, cool, I've got this motor and this arm and this base. I don't want to, you know, and I've got a, a four wheels and they're connected together into a rover that can move around. And I just want to configure that. Once you have that configured, what happens then is that immediately anyone can view a UI where they can go start pressing buttons. They can start moving motors, moving arms, reading sensors. So now I've got someone who's not a programmer, who's maybe a mechanical engineer or someone, you know, a hardware tinkerer. And without writing any code, with just using this UI, they can go and test their robot, see if it works, drive it around, move the arm around, and see if the hardware actually can accomplish what they want. At the same time, right, again, immediately upon doing this, any software engineer can talk to any piece of that robot using standard intuitive APIs in any language. One of the core beliefs in VM is that you should be able to use any language you want, any tools that you want, and tooling should be completely standard. So we use gRPC under the covers, which means you can use almost any language you want, whether it's Python, C++, Go, Rust, TypeScript, really anything to start writing your code. And then immediately you can start doing this. And what happens, right? So now we've done this. We've got a simple to use UI to configure your robot. You've got easy to use APIs. What happens is that you can iterate much faster. You don't have to have a hardware person build the perfect thing and then go and attach software to it and then realize that something's wrong, right? You can iterate much, much tighter between the hardware people, the software people, the actual hardware, which motors you use, what arms you use, all of it, right? And when that iteration cycle gets faster, that's when good things happen. One of my core beliefs about all products is that one of the key factors in success is iteration time. If your iteration time is measured in days, months, or a year, the odds of succeeding go down dramatically. When your iteration time is minutes, maybe days, you can move so much faster and it changes your entire outlook on how you build things. Or it lets you experiment more. It lets you bring new ideas on board faster and test them out. It just makes, makes it easier to go faster. And that's one of the key things we want to do is let people go much, much faster. Also, these software APIs are designed to be used by any software engineer. They're simple enough that anyone who's ever written code before can understand what they do. And that anyone who understands robots and has extra things they want to do and you know more powerful things can do it as well. Right? All very straightforward. Next, so now you've got the software that you can configure and you've got APIs. What else can we do? Well, one of the other things we do is we want to make intelligent use of the cloud. So everything I've said to date, you can do with the cloud if you want. So you can go to app.vm.com, configure your robot, drive your robot, et cetera. And what this does is a couple of things. One is that means that anyone can test the robot out from anywhere. So maybe I've got someone working on hardware in a lab like this. And then I've got a software person in San Francisco. They can go and watch the robot, see what it's doing, drive it around, and start writing code from San Francisco completely easily, just like they're in the room. Obviously, there's laws of physics and latency, but most things you can do remotely and it'll work just fine. It also means that they get logs, remote control, diagnostics, all live as well. And even things like SSH. So immediately when you turn this thing on, you have the option of turning on SSH. So if that person in San Francisco wants to run code locally, 
They can just SSH in and do whatever they want. So all those things are done for you out of the box. Another core belief we have is that going from not having robots doing the things we were talking about before to having fully autonomous robots doing those things is too far of a leap. Okay. Having a robot drive around and actually solve problems completely autonomously tomorrow, it's a lot, right? So how do we bridge those gaps? First is we have this fundamental belief in semi-autonomous robots. So in VM, teleoperation is built in. So it's very easy to build a robot, start driving it around and doing things. Maybe you want to fix potholes in New York, right? This is one of my favorites. I really want potholes fixed in New York. There are no robots doing it today. We'd like to solve that. So I build a robot, have someone drive it around from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. from any, again, from anywhere in the world. As they're driving it around, what do you do? You start collecting data. Use that data to start automating it, build machine, you know, use machine learning to build new models, update, make it more and more autonomous. So maybe you start out with one person managing one robot, but then over time, you know, maybe in two years, you get one person managing two robots. And then maybe a little bit later, you've got one person managing 10 robots or 100 robots. And at that point, you realize the solution is so effective and so cost effective. I don't even care if it's more autonomous than that. It's already working. It's already solving the actual real world problem. Is it as interesting as a fully autonomous robot? Maybe not, but it's actually now solving the problems. Because at the end of the day, you know, robots are tools for humans to be more efficient, not a cool science project. Hi, just real quickly, forgive me for interrupting here, really enjoying it. Uh, we're just seeing your camera, there's not a PowerPoint presentation with it, that, right? Yeah, correct. Wonderful, no, 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 that's what I wanted. Good, we'll carry on then, thank you. You're just looking at the robots in the back. No, really good. So the next thing, you know, we I just said, you know, hey, it's great to drive a robot around, collect data, improve machine learning, et cetera. So one of the other things you can do in VM is make that easier. So we make it very easy through configuration to collect data on the robot, sync that to the cloud, label the data in the cloud, build models from that data, and then deploy those models back down to the robot. This is all built with this idea that, hey, a robot may be offline for three hours while it's out in a field, or maybe offline for four days because there's no internet connection. Maybe there's a poor internet connection for a while and you don't want to be synchronizing data because you need real-time communication and you can only synchronize the data sometimes. So it has all the features you need to make that work. And so now you can get the data very easily from the robot to the cloud, again, label it right in the tool, build models, and then deploy it to your robots, right? So you can actually iterate very quickly on models, test out new models very easily, add new data to it, all without having to go write a lot of software or build a lot of complex systems, right? Because again, all, just like overall robotics, machine learning works best when you can iterate quickly. You can see what happens, collect more data, label new data, build new models, adjust how you build the models, deploy the models, test them. All those things is all those things are critical to making robots more autonomous over time. So we said earlier that we want to work with any hardware. So how does that work, right? In a, in a system like this, how do you add support for hardware? How do you add support for a new arm? So a couple of key things. One is everything that lives on a robot, all of our software, all of VM software that runs on your robot or on any robot is open source. So why do we do this? One is for modularity. We'll come back to that in a moment. And the second is for security and privacy. Right? If you're going to have robots running around in public or in your house, you're going to want to know what's happening. You're going to want to be able to audit that, hey, this thing actually is secure. Hey, if I set a, a privacy setting that no one else can see the camera in my living room, that no one else can see that camera. And a lot of the adjacent spaces, IoT and the like, haven't had a unbelievably good privacy or security track record. And I don't think that it's possible for any company to write software that is perfect without it being looked at and audited. And I just think open source is the right way to do this. 
So every bit of software that we write that runs on a robot is open source. Now, this also means the drivers you write work against all the open source APIs. So let's say you're writing a driver for a new ARM. You write a driver in any language that you want. It's again, all gRPC, you can do it in any language. And then anyone else can then go and deploy that driver very easily. We've actually got a new feature launching in a few weeks to make that even easier. Well, there'll be a registry on vm.com where you can go and see all the drivers, upload your own driver. And then when you're configuring a robot, you can very easily just pull that driver in. All again, very, very easily. And some of the, most of those drivers are probably gonna be open source, but if you want to publish a closed source driver as well, that's also fine. The other thing in VM that's modular is algorithms and other bits of software. So VM has built-in solutions for motion planning, for SLAM, for computer vision. So if you look at SLAM, we wrap Google, Google Cartographer, right? So it's an, we have an open source wrapper for Cartographer. And the way that ours works is it collects data. You know, you start a mapping session, you collect data on a robot, that data gets pushed from the robot to the cloud. The map is built in the cloud so that you can use faster computers and make better maps. It also means that you can share data from lots of different computer, lots of different robots to make even better maps. Then you can go and tweak those maps in the cloud and then push those maps back down to the robots. Maybe you don't like Google Cartographer. Maybe you want to use something else. Maybe you are trying to build your own SLAM algorithm that's better than everything else. Maybe you're a researcher who wants to do something. Maybe you're a commercial company that wants to go build a really, really good SLAM algorithm that's much better than anything else on the market. All of those things are possible. You can go and write a plugin for SLAM, for motion planning, for computer vision. You can deploy it to the registry. This can be open source or closed source. Anyone else in the community can start using it, either for free or will support paid modules. So if you want to build a commercial SLAM offering and have people pay for it, you can do that right in the system. This does a couple of things. One is we really hope to encourage lots of innovation in these areas, right? A lot of these areas are unsolved problems from a robotic standpoint. There is no off the shelf SLAM solution that just works great all the time. We want to make that easier. We want to make it really easy for anyone who wants to go build one to do that, to focus on the SLAM portion of it and not have to worry about how do I deploy it? How do I monetize it? How do I do all these things? So everything in VM is pluggable and that's sort of by design. I've mentioned a few times that you can deploy SLAM to your robot or modules to your robot or, mo or anything like that to your robot. You can also deploy your own code. So in VM, you'll be able to very easily manage the versions of VM running on there, the versions of your software running on there, the version of any modules. So you can actually have one single pane of glass to see the status of all of your robots, to deploy versions of code to all of your robots to understand what's going on and to make it really easy to actually go and build a robotics business. So that's a lot of the pieces of VM. There, there's a lot more, there's a lot of very cool stuff. And again, everything we're doing is designed to make it easier and easier for people to actually go and build robots. So Veeam is obviously a, it's a project that you have product that you have to go and try and use. And so I thought I would just do a quick demo of the kinds of things you can do in Veeam and everything I'm about to do, you can do yourself very easily. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Uh, I'm just going to confirm that you can see that. Yes, we can. Great. So this is VM.com. So the first thing we're going to do is in our office, we have the ability to actually go and drive a robot around. So we're just going to go and try that. I'll show you how it works. You just click on the try now link and we're going to use one of my previous robots and it's going to go configure the robot. And the reason why we did this is actually four, um, four little octagons in the back. Um, maybe I can show you later. And uh, what they do is let you have each one of them has a rover. You can take it over for 10 minutes and then you could understand what the cloud looks like. You can start writing code against those robots. You can write some Python code to drive the robots around, use computer vision, really any part of VM that you want. You can test out with these, ro with these rovers and then you could use it once or you can keep using it. And I'm a big believer in that, you know, seeing is believing. 
and that yeah it's cool i can understand that this thing might be an interesting but i'm a i understand you know, engineers are um not pessimistic but certainly curmudgeonly as a group right engineers are not going to believe any marketing and they're like you're probably going to like listen to what i'm saying and believe half of it and that's justified and i you know i've been in your shoes so we want to make it really easy before you even buy hardware or install vm for you to just try it out and see what's going on um so that's what we're gonna so that's what we do here right we let you just go and try your robots um so this robot is called lively voice and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn the camera on um and so this is the camera view and actually you can get an overhead view as well so here it is and then we're just going to drive it around super exciting you know you can look for stars and we've put little uh, stickers on the walls so that you can see um see different places or you can do computer vision so you can start writing code that's like hey go and uh you know find the blue star or the red circle and you can just drive it around um all the communication is over WebRTC, so no matter where you are it should be as well be as low latency as possible right the same technology that makes zoom work and makes this conference work well works for this so then this is the sort of uh, little remote control thing you can go and look at every motor and so you can play with each motor independently you know for example if we go and turn this camera off we're going to go to the, the left motor and we're just going to make this guy go in circles because we're mean that way um and then any component so when I was saying earlier that you can go and immediately sort of press buttons this is what we're talking about right so we've got encoders that you can go look at um the cameras there's a game pad so if you want to hook up a Xbox controller via Bluetooth you can do all that and so this is the, the very simple thing you can then go and write code so this is what the sample Python code would look like um and it just connects to each one of the components so you can start understanding what's there and how to do it and we have examples in Python Go TypeScript and C++ up, up here and this is the last thing I'll show you is the configuration tab so here are all the components um so if we go look at a, a motor for example so this is the left motor you can see it's a GPIM motor so it's actually a Raspberry Pi on these rovers and there is a motor driver connected directly to the the pins on a Raspberry Pi so you can see that you know uh A and B are connected to these pins the PWM is connected to this pin we can figure how many ticks per rotation to make it to get the number of rotations nice um what the encoder is and it's all just here you can go turn these into a base so a base is sort of like a rover we say it's a wheeled base because it's got four two wheels on it you say hey these are the right motors these are the left motors you know what size is it and then you can go and start playing around with it all pretty straightforward um and all relatively entertaining um and again this is all free so anyone who wants can just go to vm.com and click on try now and, and start playing with it um one of the uh the other key things that we want is to make it really easy for people to to learn so there is actually a if you go to docs.vm.com there's a lot of tutorials and some of them are oddly simple you know we've gotten questions like why are there you know tutorials on how to like turn a light on or off or make a simple plant watering robot and the answer is that I've always believed that very simple examples are the most educational in terms of understanding how something works and so we have a lot of good examples on there for you to go play with so what do we want what do we want you all to do well one you know obviously this is a new product and we think it's a very good start but we know there's lots we have to do we know there's things that aren't perfect and we would love feedback we want people to play with it to test it out to tell us what's wrong ideally nicely but if you want to do it meanly that's okay too we've got a discord channel we've got a community that's growing so you know come hang out with us and tell us what you like and tell us what you don't like and at a higher level you know we want 
lots more robots in the world. Okay. I said before, we want thousands of robot startups. You know, I keep seeing more and more robotic startups, but I want hundreds times more. There, there are way more companies doing social stuff, social media, Twitter things than there are doing robotics companies. And we need to change that, right? Because there are actually real world problems that no matter how cool your digital only solutions are, aren't going to actually do anything unless they impact the real world, right? Robotics is the incarnation of sort of all the software that we know how to write, all the tools, all the machine learning, everything that we can do. If you want it to impact the real world, you need to actually do things in the real world. Robotics has more potential to actually do interesting things and good things for the world than any technology that's come along in a very long time, right? No one, anyone you ask who's like, you know, what drives you crazy every day? You know, what problems do you want to see fixed in the world? What bothers you on a daily basis? None of them are digital. Right? Most of them aren't digital. Most of them are in the real world. My kids leave a, the dining room table a mess. I, there's a pothole on the way to work. Wildfires in Canada made New York really smoky, right? Real world problems need actual things in the real world. And that's where robotics comes to play. So I would really love if everyone here started building robots, started trying to fix real world problems using robotics, using automation, and actually made a really big difference in how they could do it. Encourage your hardware friends, your software friends. It doesn't matter, right? One of the things that we care the most about is making robotics accessible to everyone. Not making it a toy, not making it like a STEM project, actually making it easy to go build real robots that solve real world problems. So now I'm love to take some questions and uh, make this pretty conversational and see, you know, what people are curious about and how we can go from there. Thank you very much. Yeah, fascinating. Really, genuinely, very, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, so I, I'll disclose that I also had the pleasure of being at um, the ICRA Robotics Conference a couple of weeks ago and got to see it in person as well, um, and uh, meet a couple of staff there. It's I mean, the elephant in the room, what I know is um, uh, one of the questions is how does it compare to ROS? The immediate thing that I think of when comparing it to ROS is the fact that I, in the robotics community, we get lots of questions from people asking how to use ROS, but we've only seen examples of people actually making Viam work. And the fact that you can log onto a website and give a live demonstration is very impressive. And I think that does speak to the, um, the I guess, holistic nature of attempting robotic software in that sense? So I think it's a couple of things, right? One is, you know, if you sort of the question is, you know, what about Ross? You know, how does VM compare to Ross? What's going on? I think there's sort of two very different ways, two di very different pieces to that answer, right? One is a VM is a comprehensive platform. So it has the cloud, it has the cloud side of it. You know, the, all the features you talked about, you know, remote control, data management, all those things built in, right? Which again, make a lot of the other things easier. You know, even deploying new versions, it's sort of, because it's holistic and built in, it just makes it easier. Two is for actually programming a robot. You know, when Ross started, I'm gonna say 15 years ago, right? The software engineering world looks very different today than it did 15 years ago. Right. The software engineering world has learned a lot of things about building systems, building robust solutions, low latency, high throughput, you know, you know, even edge computing, how model, how AI works and machine learning is going to work. Right. So there's been a lot of learning about how to write software and how to build large scale distributed software. And VM has incorporated all of those things. You know, 20, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Most of the robotics research, most of the robotics work, and even today, right, a very high percentage of robotics work being done every day is in research or academic settings. VM is all about how you take the robotics research, the interesting science that's happened, the science that's going to happen, and bringing it to the real world, right, getting it out of a lab, putting it into people's lives. And for that, you need different solutions, right? You need solutions that are easier to debug, easier to test, easier to work with. The other, the last thing I'll say is that there is no part of VM that requires you to rip out anything else, right? As I said before, we are incredibly modular. 
So we have clients that start with Ross, they're using Ross and they put VM on top of Ross for cloud offerings and they slowly are migrating things from Ross to VM or they don't plan on migrating it because it's, if it's working, why break it, right? We are pragmatic to a fault, right? I have always been a pragmatist. And my general belief is we will do anything we can to bring more robots to the world, right? So if it makes sense to make it easier for people using Ross to use VM, we'll do that. If it makes sense for people to just, you know, start new projects because most of the new, most of the robots are going to be new, we'll do that, right? It's all about how do we get more and more robots? Even, even just to go further on that. So as I've said before, everything that we write that goes onto your robot is open source. Our cloud offering is all consumption-based pricing. So let's say you're using us to store data. We charge per gigabyte. There's no per robot fees. There's no setup fee. There's no, there's none of that. So we make no money from two people playing with a robot, right? We only make money, even if someone has like two robots that are doing something kind of interesting, we don't make a lot of money. That's not a business that we're interested in, right? We will only do well as a company if there are millions, right? If there's a billion robots in 10 years, right? That's everything we're doing is how do we get you know, a billion, you know, a billion new robots doing actually useful things that people care about. That's what we care. That's what we want. Gosh, there's a lot yeah. of things about there. Really interesting. I'll let someone else speak so I don't hog it. But yes, thank you. Fascinating. Yeah, well, I had a, I had a question. Um, so you talked about uh, VM is hardware agnostic. You can use it with whatever robot, whatever um, parts, whatever uh, slam algorithm or whatever. Uh, what are some of the challenges in making such a flexible platform, right? There's a wide variety of, uh, of applications you're targeting, and that has to take a lot of, uh, a lot of thought to, uh, to do right. So, yep, I, I completely agree. So the hardest part at first and foremost is understanding the right abstractions, right? Motor is in some ways the easiest. Has the few as a small surface area. It still has interesting things, um, but let's take a different one. Let's take a class of sensors that involve motion. So, what do you have there? You have everything from an IMU to a GPS to a water wheel that tells you how fast you're moving in the water. Right? These are all things that we've connected. So, I think we so we we decided to make one sensor type. Right, so it's one component type in VM that has APIs for location compass heading, linear and angular acceleration, linear and angular velocity. Now, some of these, some sensors that implement this interface will only implement some of those things, right? An IMU, you know, maybe you have an IMU that only does angular acceleration and everything else is left for a user to deal with. Maybe you've got a, maybe you've got a, a sensor package that actually implements all those things. We wrap them up into one API. Why? So that you have one API that gives you all the power you need to actually go and do different things with navigation to understand things without having to use different components while understanding that different pieces of hardware can support different things. The other thing we've done is every API we have is also extensible. So it's both modular and extensible, meaning you can go implement any driver that you want for any piece of hardware that you want, or virtual drivers, let's say you've got an IMU and a GPS and you wanna use that to infer other things. You can then go wrap those other two you know, movement sensors and a third movement sensor that is purely virtual that can, you know, does sensor fusion. And again, any consumer of that doesn't care, right? They just see the same APIs, they see the same thing. Now, what about a, a motor, right? Do you put, you know, how much torque, you know, how, how many torque commands do you put in a motor? It's hard to tell, but what we do is make everything extensible. So that let's say that you have a motor that has more features and you need to add more, you wanna add more features. You're, 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 you're writing the driver for a motor and you wanna expose more features, great, you just do it. The best, you know, I, as I said before, I, I come from the database space. So I use a lot of database analogies, but my favorite, the best analogy I have for this is, is SQL. It's funny for me talking about SQL, but we'll do it anyway. So there is a SQL standard, there's been many SQL standards, and you know, um, SQL 89 
dating myself here. Uh, SQL 89 was a standard that was used for many years. And every single database, so relational database vendor implemented that standard and also implemented a ton of other things in the language, right? Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, all of them had their own extensions. And it worked pretty well. Was it perfect? No. Was it pretty good? Did it make things work pretty well for most users most of the time? Yes, it did. And we're taking a pretty similar approach. There's a standard. It's very easy for any driver implementer to implement any method they want and expose it to their users, but still meet the API. That was a long answer to your question, but hopefully it makes that sense. That was a great answer. Yeah. I appreciate the detail. Taking a pragmatic approach and, you know, not letting perfect be the enemy of good enough, which can so often be a deal breaker for robotics projects. Yeah, I mean, I said at the beginning, I am a uh, pragmatic to a fault. Mm. So one question I've got someone in the um, uh, comments who is asking, could you give a bit more detail on the decision to use GRPC over DDS? Uh, I'm naive to both of those terms. Great. Um, so let's go, let's back up a second. So DDS is the hub subsystem that's in ROS and GRPC is the communication language we use. So let's just take it again, let's just go, go up a layer for, and forgetting those specific details of those two things for the moment. The, the first big question is pub sub versus RPC, right? So uh, for those who don't know, the way pub sub works is you put a message onto a bus and then that's it. And then you can listen for other messages. So let's say you want to go send a message in a purely pub sub world. You put a message onto a bus that says, set the motor to 50% power or at a five RPM, you know, whatever you want. How do you know if the motor got that message? Well, you can do a couple of things. One is you can listen to messages coming back from the motor or the encoder saying how fast it's going. Or maybe someone could put an error onto the bus saying, hey, there was an error. But either way, you're sort of waiting for something to happen, right? You've got to write code to handle that. Right? It's like async programming, but it's distributed asynchronous programming, which is complicated. And I know that because that's what Mongo is, or right? as a distributed database and getting distributed systems working is really hard. So now let's talk about RPC. In RPC, you say, hey, motor, go at 5 RPM. And it will respond saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Or you get an error. So what are the pros and cons of each? So PubSub is great and is used a lot of cases for distributed systems where you don't know what kinds of consumers you have. You don't know the state of things. Com things come online and offline all the time, right? You need to add capacity, right? Some of the big web scale um, consumer companies got famous for using PubSub because that's how they were able to scale under you know, scale workloads because, you know, if they've got, you know, something pumping messages onto a, a system and they can add consumers of that pub subsystem as demand dictates. Now let's go to a robot, right? In a robot, a couple of things. One is you know exactly what hardware you have and you wanna know if it is there or failing or, or broken, right? You're not adding extra motors to your robot in real time. Like that just like, <laughs> that'd be cool, but that's not a thing that's physically possible, right? So you know exactly what hardware you have. Two is when you send a message to a piece of hardware, you want to you want to know that it got that message and that it said okay. You know it's not an error state and it's not offline, right? Like error handling is important, and RPC just makes error handling easier, makes code easier to write. You can still do async programming in the language of your choice using the language tools, which are again much much easier for developers to actually work with. Once you decide to use RPC. Then you've got a few choices. You can write your own RPC system. You can use something off the shelf. And gRPC is just a very good standard. It's been used for Google for God knows how many years. They keep making it better. It is incredibly efficient. There are tools for it in basically every single language that exists. And one of the things that we pride ourselves in is taking the best tools available. If there is something that exists in the world that we can use, why start from scratch? Right? The, less, the least amount of software we can write is the best thing we could possibly do. So gRPC works well, it's fast, it's reliable, it's widely, widely used in very high performance systems. So that's why we chose to use it. 
And same with WebRTC, right? If you look at our entire networking, and we're talking about networking, so let's talk about the whole networking stack for a second. Same with WebRTC, right? Why invent a new way to do peer-to-peer -peer communication? We're using uh, every, there's a little concept in VM called locations. You can break your you know, robots down. Every location has its own TLS certificate, right? So we're just using standard tools that exist applying them to robots to give people the best possible way to make robots work. Really interesting. I was going to say, I was going to ask, you know, how do you add new languages so quickly? But I think that just answered it. You know, if you're relying on gRPC, you know, pretty much every language that's used by anyone, you know, for, for any uh, real application has some kind of gRPC library you know, you can just build on top of. So like, you know, Rust or TypeScript, I mean, do you guys just kind of wrap an existing gRPC application, you know, library in your own code or? Yep, we do, we basically have to wrap it and then we add in our authentication and then connect it to WebRTC because we're we're, channel, uh, we're tunneling gRPC over WebRTC. Okay. So it's not no work to add a new language, but it's all, it's, you know, it's like a month of work per language, which is not, okay. you know, which is a, you yeah. know, for us, it's a pretty small amount of work, you know, relative to everything else. Yeah, and support, yeah, yeah. And supporting a dozen, you know, we assume we're going to have a, do a dozen SDKs pretty soon, and supporting a dozen SDKs isn't a big deal. You know, we even have an, a Flutter SDK, right? Really? So that means okay. that you can very easily uh, connect to any robot from a native web app. Hmm. That's super interesting. Yeah, um, I mean, you mentioned some of your cloud services. Is there any kind of heterogeneous computing that you're doing there? Like, do you offer, uh, or you, do you plan on offering any, you know, graphics cards or AI accelerators or FPGA cards or anything of that kind of thing that would speed up like SLAM or image processing or anything like that? So short answer is yes. So let's talk, so the only thing we're doing today in that space is we do build, if, you, if you're using us for data management and do your labeling with us, we will build models for you. Um, and there we do give you access to sort of fast ways to build models. Uh, again, that is also all pluggable. So if you want to use something else to build models, great. You want to use something else to label images, great. Everything is API driven. You can plug and play which pieces of our system you want to use uh, very easily. You, it's not a closed wall, no APIs kind of thing. It's, there are APIs for everything we do. Um, yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So, uh, going back a little bit, and there's also, this is building onto, um, a comment that a user has asked really interesting the way you explain the differences between, yeah, DDS and, um, GRPC. And I think part, part of that, I guess, in, in your explanation is seeing how for, for ROS, it would make sense to use DDS because that builds off the publisher subscriber concept that everyone knows and uses. But, I mean, I can certainly say from experience having to replicate the aspects of, you know, um, Wi-Fi connectivity, or if you're setting up a multi-robot uh, environment, that's something that takes a lot of work. And in this case, is handled very well by the fact it's been done at, in I guess a more professional standard, really, of doing it through web-based cloud. Um, it does seem like the more business-ready, you know, commercialization-ready approach to doing it, which is- yep, and it's just, Yep, and it's just flexible. So yeah. like on a robot, right? Maybe, you know, who knows how you want to build your robot. If it's in a office environment, maybe you want to have four different computers, like a two Raspberry Pis and two Jetsons, I don't know, all connected to the same Wi-Fi. Maybe if it's in the field, you want to have the same set of computers, but a local LAN and a, a MOFI handling connectivity, right? Again, because we're using standard tools, all these things are available. We're actually putting up a tutorial on how to set up a, a, no, a network on a robot uh, that load balances between a Wi-Fi connection and a cell modem. Right? All these things just become easier because there you can now use all the standard tools and not have to sort of worry about it too much. Yeah, yeah, certainly I'm thinking about the pain of having to do it and how this could yeah. uh, take that pain away from me, and that makes yeah. it really quite appealing. You know, you, um, you, you bring up a good point about like sort of the ease of deployment. And the other thing about VM that I haven't mentioned is that it is trivial to deploy on any machine, right? If you have any relatively sane Linux box, right? Anything in the last five or six years, it's going to just run, 
right? You can just, it's a single binary install. You download it, you run it. That's it, right? It takes 30 seconds. Um, you know, actually, you know what? I'm going to, it's, it's so, uh, it's so different than what's out there. I'm going to just show it quickly. Uh, cause it's, it's worthwhile. Um, here we are. So, um, can you see this? I mean, this is it, right? If you want to install it on a Raspberry Pi, you know, you're basically just doing this and you install it. it it's that simple. Two lines. So at the, uh, at the layer below that, right? Cause you're going to have a Raspberry Pi or something doing the, the high level control, but you're also probably going to have a microcontroller or a motor driver or something. How is that treated by? So, uh, so a couple different things. So one is, let's say you've got a motor driver. Um, you can have a, a simple motor driver. Let's say it's uh, like the one I, the example I showed you before that just uses the pinouts on a Raspberry Pi. That becomes just a motor driver. You write a driver for VM that wraps or a, that wraps whatever low level communication protocol you have and make that work. Now that fundamentally works the same way for something that uses I squared C or CAN or it doesn't matter. Uh, again, there's, an, there's a company that we work with, a partner of ours called Intermode. They make a pretty, a very cool uh, base. You get, it's that black robot on the back. Um, they use a, a, so there's, it's a CAN bus network to actually control the motors. So there's a driver to connect from VM to the CAN bus network and control the drivers. It doesn't matter, right? It's all kind of the same thing. As long as there's some way to get to that. Now, if you have something that you want to run um, on a microcontroller, like an ESP32, we actually have a micro RDK coming out soon. So you can run an RDK on an, like an ESP32 or a little bit later an SDM32, those kinds of chips for certain kinds of things. Yeah, that's what I was wondering if you had a, a layer there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we call it our micro RDK, both because it's small and because it runs on microprocessors. So, you know. I don't know if we're great at naming things, but sort of clever. <laughs> Keep it simple. Okay, we're we're about out of questions. Um, uh, but thank and thank you, really, really good uh, pitch. I, I would say um, you, you're acknowledging that at the start of the conversation. I, I was a bit cynical, and and yeah, certainly there's a lot to be said for it. Um, I'm really gonna have to have a think about it. One, one thing as well, I've seen the website, the Rover that you've shown is $99. How did you get it to $99? Because that almost seemed, I almost looked at that and thought it was a loss leaders part of promotion. Um, um, that's an interesting that story. Happen. Yep. So about a year ago, you know, we were thinking about, okay, we're gonna try to get all these software people to start playing with robots and get buy a robot and try it in their house. So we knew it had to be a cheap thing to start off with. So we looked, we bought every robot kit on the internet we could find that was relatively cheap and built them and played with them. And mostly they just weren't that good, right? They either weren't, uh, the hardware wasn't good. They weren't extensible. They weren't high powered enough. It just, they weren't, they weren't great. And we're like, we want something that's under a hundred dollars. Now you, you still have to add your own compute. So you can add a Raspberry Pi or a, Hi, Nano. So you get to, you know, you, whatever, but you can put kind of whatever compute on there you want, and we'll add more tutorials or adding more things on there. Um, we wanted something that was actually cheap. So we decided to build our own. We, it's all, it's all built. We source the parts. It's all, you know, the bomb, I think is 49 bucks. We get them to New York um, assembled for, it's called 60 bucks. We had to ship them out a little bit. And so basically we try to sell them at exactly our cost. They're not loss leaders at all. They are basically at cost, um, but you can buy it for 99 bucks. You can put whatever computer you want on there and you're off to the races. Um, and it's really just a way to, to get people going. All the designs for it are also open source. So all the schematics, the designs, the, um, the CAD, I'm pretty sure the CAD drawings for the actual, like anything that's printed, all of it's open source. So if you like the design, but don't want to buy it from us, it's fine. You know, we just, again, you know, back to what I've said before is we want more people building more robots. And this is a way to get more people building robots. And that was entirely the idea. Okay. 
So that's, I mean, it's a really cool concept. Um, would you consider doing that with other robotics applications like arms or drones or? Um, we would definitely, again, I'm gonna say it again, we are pragmatic to a fault. So hundred percent, we will definitely consider it if there are areas um, where it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Some ways our preference is to work with partners, you know, find some startup that wants to go build rovers and make that their business and go partner with them. But if there's no one doing that and we think it needs to exist for the space to advance, well, we might just do it ourselves. Okay. And then I've got uh, just one more question on my end about um, like high school robotics competitions. You know, I've coached some of these teams and right now, I mean, the tools that you know, people have made are very cool, but you still need to like know how to program in like Java and you need to know how to like fix Java environment issues and all that kind of good stuff which I mean is, is a lot to ask of like a sophomore in high school, honestly, like, or, or anyone, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or anyone really for being, uh, really honest with ourselves. No. Like, yeah. 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 So actually we are, we are starting to figure out how to work with first robotics. Um, just starting to work with, we're working with a couple of teams in New York. So uh, the short answer is we're very interested in that, in working with first robotics and the educational space in general. You know, one of the, things that drives me crazy about the robotic space today is let's, let's move away from robotics for a moment. Let's say you're in a high school programming class and you build a website. What tools are you going to use? Python and Mongo? And of course I'm going to choose Mongo, but you're probably going to use Python and Mongo. Whatever you use, whether it's Python and Mongo or TypeScript and it's a single page app, like there aren't high school programming languages. You know, there are maybe elementary school like um, Scratch, but once you're a sophomore in high school, like you're using professional tools. That should be the way it works in robotics too, right? There shouldn't be like the tools a sophomore in high school uses should be the same kinds of tools that they want. If they want to, you know, build robots for the next decade or two decades of their life should flow nicely into that. It shouldn't be cool. I learned this thing. That's kind of a toy. Now I got to like start all over again. And I learned how to use Java to build my robot. And now I got to learn something else and everything is different. That's yeah. Makes people not I mean, want to that's do it. why we're all good at 3D printing because the tools across the software is consistent enough where you transition over the years from one to the next. And exactly. Yeah. Right. That's a, that's a great yeah. example. Right? That's why. And so we need to do the same thing for actually robots, right? So you start in high school, you use the same tools as you get older, more experienced, mm -hmm. build cooler robots. You just you make better use of the tools. You don't have to start from scratch again. Yeah. 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 Or well, you don't have to go through a really steep learning curve as you familiarize yourself with a different level of, um, you know, professionalism that's required for you to do robotics at the next level sort of thing. You don't have to climb mountains to uh, get to where you want to go. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. I will be sure to follow up uh, and I hope to see more of um, Viam's work. I know we have another um, presentation in our session that includes their work, which I'm looking forward to as well. Um, and uh, yes, I'll be keen to see progress in the future. It sounds very exciting. Great. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for having me. And this has been uh, really fun. Thank you again Thank you for, for your presentation. It's been really wonderful having you. Wonderful. All right. Have a, uh, have a great day. So you too. Wonderful. We're missing the next, uh, the, the next two participants, unfortunately, do not appear to have shown up, which is a real shame. If they do show up, we will absolutely make time for them. But in that case, we will instead go to uh, Dan, who is, um, Frank has a really good robot I'm looking forward to anyway. And that means we can give them a bit more time to talk as well. So Dan, if you're ready. I am ready, I am. Let me share my screen and then I'll take over. Wonderful. Uh, good, okay, so. Perfect. Okay, hi everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, so my name is Dan. And as some of you may already know, I, on occasion, make things. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about one of those things, which is the guy you hopefully see on your screen in front of you. It is an open source desktop companion robot. So let's jump in. Uh, first of all, who am I? Well, I'm a software engineer. I have nearly two decades of experience, but actually none of that, at least professionally, is in robotics. 
everything I've learned in order to build this project has been through open source or freely available means. So why am I telling you that? Well, because I know not everybody is a robotics expert on this call. Um, and because you need to understand that if I can build a project like this, then so can you. In fact, you can build this project if you wanted to, and we'll talk about that in a second. So I had a few goals when I went into building this project. Um, I wanted it to be fully autonomous because the idea was it wasn't something that needed to navigate a space. It wasn't something that needed to perform a task. It was going to be a companion. It was going to be something that I could interact with. And I didn't like the idea of puppeteering it and kind of almost faking the reactions because of that sort of thing. I wanted it to be able to uh, rely on computer input in terms of uh, computer vision or audio for voice recognition, whatever it might be. Um, secondly, I wanted it to be modular and upgradable. Now, I've been working on this project for a couple of years, and the, the number of versions I've been through has been quite substantial, as you'll come to see. And actually having it built in a modular way means that if I need to upgrade something or something explodes and I need to swap it out, I don't have to rebuild the robot to accommodate the new piece of uh, hardware or whatever it might be. Um, and similarly, for the same reasons, it needs to be upgradable so that if, for example, the Raspberry Pi is currently a 3B+, plus and I want to upgrade it to a 4, uh, I can hopefully just swap that out and not have to change too much about the structure or the components that are connected. I wanted it to be open source. Uh, you know, for those of you who aren't aware of these things, uh, open source is effectively meaning that if you wanted to, you could download this, uh, the plans to 3D print everything, the code, build your own version, and there wouldn't be any costs involved, at least from my side in terms of charges. But more than that, I wanted it to be accessible because it's fair enough to say I've made this project and it's open source, but if I'm using actuators that cost tens of thousands of pounds, uh, that's going to be a bit of a barrier to entry for a lot of people. Now, personally, my budget for this project was pretty much zero for most of the time. So uh, I wanted to make it something that other people could build without a, a ton of cash to have to invest in it. Um, and, then, and then finally, and probably most importantly, I wanted it to be fun. I started out doing this just to see what I could build with these technologies. Uh, you know, I've been interested in robotics since I was a kid, but nothing like Arduino or Raspberry Pis existed back then. Uh, and so it was great to be able to go through and see what was possible and download some, again, open source software myself, try that out, see if it worked, improve on it, and so on. Uh, so my initial concept uh, was it, uh, what I affectionately named an animated cube. You'll start to see a pattern that I'm not particularly good at naming things. And you'll also tell from the form that I'm not particularly good at designing things for aesthetics either. Uh, so this guy was a cube that started out fastened or connected to the base. And then when it detected motion, it would rise up off the base and it would animate in a way as you, you kind of see with this proof of concept here. Um, it had a Raspberry Pi inside it. It had a few servos in order to make that pan and tilt motion. And it had a linear actuator that was presumably something I got off eBay for a few pounds uh, to, to make it raise up from the base. It had NeoPixels inside so that they would shine through the, the kind of pattern cuts that you can see around the, uh, the cube. And then actually one of the holes on the front was a camera uh, so that it could do face recognition and that kind of thing. Um, I actually really liked this idea, and this was the initial reason for me building it. Um, but in practice, once you put a Raspberry Pi in there and you put a few batteries in there and you put servos in there, there isn't a lot of freedom for the movement that we were looking for. Uh, so in actual fact, it ended up just being a little bit restrictive. And back then I didn't have 3D printing. So actually probably these days you could design it in a way that would make it a little bit better. But this is made with foam board cut into the right shape. And I think the original idea was to have a laser cut uh, piece of plastic or something like that, which I do have kicking around here somewhere. Um, so then I started taking a look at what foam might be better. And I think as most of the people who follow me are now aware, um, this was around the time that uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order was coming out, and obviously BD-1 was a, was a big hit, a lot of people liked that. Um, and I, I thought it, it was quite a good candidate for a similar kind of thing. Now, the idea was not to copy something that already existed, uh, but to build something that was functional. And again, I, I can't really design things particularly well in this space, 
Uh, so I was very much going for form over function, but I did like the idea of the bipedal robot. I like the idea of the animated head and being able to do that. And as you might be able to spot, those of you who are familiar with it, um, the body and, and feet from this were actually from a 3D model that somebody else designed that was based on the, the kind of BB-1. Um, so one of the other things is uh, the, a couple of these pictures are actually the neck mechanism, and that used three servos in order to allow the neck to, to kind of sit flat within the body so the head would rest on the body. And then once um, you activated it, it would pop the head up and then you could still pan and tilt in order to track faces and so on. And then bottom right, you can see my very first version, again, before I had a 3D printer where I was building things out of wood, uh, just as a proof of concept to see if it worked. And you can see within the head, there was the Raspberry Pi with a camera and some NeoPixels, which are kind of addressable LEDs. Uh, and then I actually had an external microphone. And that green thing at the back was a motion sensor. So it's a microwave motion sensor. So you don't have to have an exposed uh, port like you would do with a PIR sensor. You actually just put that in the thing. And as long as it's not surrounded by a lot of metal, uh, it can detect human motion and it can actually detect it through walls as well, which is quite cool from a kind of security system perspective. Um, you can also see that I'm starting to get involved with 3D modeling. This wasn't something that I tried to, to do before this. Uh, and I actually use Tinkercad, which is a freely available um, online uh, tool. Uh, since I've moved on to, to using Onshape, because again, that is also uh, online. And what I'm trying to do is make it so that people don't have to have a specific spec machine in order to get these files and, and change them. And obviously Fusion 360, you, you get slightly limited on, on operating system and that kind of thing. Um, so I started to narrow down a list of features that I wanted to have on the project. Um, speech recognition was a big one. I wanted to be able to talk to it, give it commands, have it, you know, have it react to things as I said things. Um, motion sensing we've talked about, which was that microwave sensor. And that was really a lot to do with kind of power management. So if you're, uh, if you left the house, you wanted this thing to kind of turn itself off or go into a sleep mode or do whatever, um, you can use a microwave sensor to kind of do that rather than it having to constantly look for uh, faces or, or objects through the camera, which is quite computationally intensive. Um, I wanted it to animate because of course it needed to react. And I wanted a way of being able to not only manually key animations, but also potentially record them. So at one point I had a mechanism where you could map those animations through keyboard commands and record it to a JSON file. And then you could tell it to replay those animations and it would effectively replay the, you know, a happy dance or whatever it might be. Um, in terms of other output, we have things like LEDs, which we've talked about, the NeoPixels, uh, and then uh, a, an output for, for audio. And there was a limiting factor with the Raspberry Pi, where if you had NeoPixels connected directly to the Raspberry Pi, you had to disable audio output on the Pi itself. And um, because of that limiting factor, and because I actually already had this piece of technology available, um, I opted for a buzzer with a piece of software I wrote a few years prior called BrailleSpeak. Now, the idea basically of BrailleSpeak is that it converts text to uh, buzzer tones in a way that could be understood if you could be bothered to learn these tones. Um, so the, the kind of uh, the way that I, I explain it is if you imagine similar to the kind of droids in Star Wars where people like R2-D2 will, will beep, uh, it's effectively the same idea, except it isn't gibberish. It's actually each letter corresponds to two tones. So that's something that's you know, available and part of this as well. Um, I do also have face detection and face recognition, which are two separate things there. And, um, and obviously one of the things that you need to do if you're working on face recognition is have it so that you train it on the faces that it recognizes. You know, if you need to identify this, okay, this is Dan, then um, you would need to give it a, a whole list of, of photos of Dan, and then you would need to tell it that's who it is. And then it would need to uh, train a model to understand that that's that person. Um, and what I did at one point was make it so that at night it went to sleep and you couldn't wake it up and you couldn't get it to do anything. And it would then use that downtime in order to train the model. So we, we kind of joked that it was dreaming about the faces that it had seen during the day in order to then uh, learn them for the next day. Uh, so we also had auto shutdown. And really just the idea there was we needed a kind of safety cutoff to make sure that if... Um, 
if you you know you trap yourself in one of the, the the servos or something like that you could you could kind of turn it upside down initially and it would just kill the power and it would shut everything down safely like the raspberry pi um the tilt switch wasn't a great idea because i found that as i was testing it would inevitably fall over and that would trigger the tilt switch which would trigger a shutdown of the raspberry pi which meant i had to go through the whole startup process before i actually could continue development so now there is a button on the head that turns the raspberry pi off safely uh, there are custom PCBs and everything, most everything is 3D printed. Now the custom PCBs may sound like a huge amount of effort and, and a, a barrier to entry, but actually the files that you need in order to print these things are available in the GitHub repository. And um, you can send them to a 3D printing, sorry, to a, um, a PCB printing service. And you can generally get these things printed for a few dollars these days. So it just means the whole process is then something that you can follow using the online guide. And you don't have to worry about wiring everything up correctly as much as you would do if you were building all of this stuff from scratch. And then in terms of 3D printing, um, all of the versions past those initial ones made out of wood have been 3D printed and all of those files have hopefully been made available so that they can be used in, in, in any 3D printer. Um, with the most recent one, we're using things like bearings as well because we're focusing on stability uh, and those are readily available bearings, which we'll probably cover later on in the talk. So this was version one. And version one was very bulky. I didn't have uh, I didn't have any kind of uh, PCBs at this point. So you can see it was just bung all the wires in, make a little protocol and get it working. Um, but it did it did work. It, it was the initial concept and it did work the way that I wanted it to. It could stand up, it could sit down. It even got to the point where it could track faces around the room, although not very reliably. And one of the big problems about this was uh, the Raspberry Pi is quite slow when it comes to face tracking. So you do really need something else to kind of help out on that, which we'll, we'll talk about for version three. Um, but broadly speaking, it did what it needed to do. But in terms of size and in terms of kind of rigidity, it was very difficult to transport. You know, the legs would come off quite frequently and it was it was quite, uh, quite messy. So I started looking at a version that I could make available for people uh, that was smaller, that was more accessible, that included batteries so that you didn't have to power by an external power source. Uh, and then uh, I came up with this. So this is the first kind of version um, of version two. Uh, you can tell, again, I'm not very good at naming things. And uh, you can see here, rather than those, those uh, kind of standard servos, we're using smaller servos. We're trying to integrate them into the legs in a way that really makes them look less imposing um, and, and give it an overall more, uh, you know, more appropriate cuter design, I suppose. Uh, but all of the components are still in there that you would see in the bigger one. Uh, I just really scaled it down. And, and as I've said, I wanted to make it as small as I could make it for this version. So this is the first functional prototype. Uh, and what I ended up with was something that did work. Um, I'll just turn the sound on a little bit. And um, it could stand up, it could sit down. Again, it could track faces. Uh, and I'll show you another few features in the next slide as well. And this is the point where people really started to get interested in things because this guy you know, photographed quite well. Uh, it was quite a nice, um, a nice little project for people to do. Uh, as you can see, there were still some problems. Um, but it was broadly speaking, it was it was quite nice. Um, so I've got a couple of examples here. Now this is uh, before I finalized the body design on the left here, and this was just a startup. But the startup process actually ended up with the servos on full instead of um, instead of kind of being quite quite slow to join. So you can see that the power, despite the fact that there's batteries involved there, it was actually still strong enough with these smaller servos that it could jump up off the ground as it as it started. Um, and then the other thing that I got working for this version was commands. So you can see this example where I'm, I'm giving it a command and saying, I want you to put the flashlight on. I want you to turn the flashlight off. And it was thinking in real time and coming up with correct responses. I could ask it questions. Now, this was just give me a random answer. If I say, do you like something? So do you like cake? It says yes. Do you like bananas? It says no. And then if I ask it, are you sure? Well, that's hard coded to say, yes, I'm sure. Of course, I'm sure. But those animations were all animations that I had keyed in myself. Um, but none of this was puppeteered. It was all based on the voice recognition and the speech input that I had given it. So then 
because version two was quite small, I had a lot of challenges in terms of getting it the way that I wanted. I did have room on the very bottom to put a, a LiPo battery, but it was quite small, of course, and the Raspberry Pi is quite power hungry. Now, you might be surprised, but the Raspberry Pi is actually the most intensive thing in terms of power usage, not the servos, because the servos spend a lot of time just sitting there maintaining their position. But the Raspberry Pi, especially when it's doing, um, doing facial detection, is much more uh, is much more power hungry. And so I needed to be able to, to build something so that I could actually put more batteries in there, I could get it working uh, for longer. And I also wanted it to be a little bit more robust. And I mentioned version one, the legs were detached. Well, actually the, the same problem existed for version two. So they were pinned to the 3D printed material with screws just to kind of tighten it around the, the actual servo spindle itself. And um, I found that over time, those became worn and they would start detaching when I was testing things. And it, it just, it had reached the point where I needed to do a little bit of a redesign. And now at this point, I'd started to get a little bit better with, uh, with 3D modeling. Uh, obviously I had the 3D printer for a while and I kind of knew what sort of things I could build. So I put all of that knowledge into can I make a version that is going to be better, that is going to be more robust, that is going to last a lot longer than the previous ones would? And I also wanted to make it very, very modular. So you'll notice here that the, the legs are mirror images of each other. And it's to the point that each section actually is the same 3D printed components as the section below it. Obviously not the foot, but the two, the two other areas are as well. And the idea behind that was, well, if we uh, have a piece that breaks or a, uh, something kind of falls off as we're, as we're testing or as we're traveling with it, I can have a few spares, but I don't have to have spare parts for every single individual component because most of them are a repeat of something else on the, on the robot itself. And then you'll notice that the body itself is three main levels. So the bottom level is the power management. You can actually um, put your, your DC to DC converter in there. It's, again, designed so that if people don't have the exact converter that I have, they can put their own in. It doesn't really matter. The switches on the back, if they want to use the switches, they can do. If they just want to power it through a benchtop power supply or a, a power pack, they can do whatever they want to do. Um, the middle level is actually batteries. And I've been using 18650 batteries there to, um, to try and have a safe way of, I just take them out and recharge them. I've seen horror stories of people plugging in chargers into their homemade robots and having the whole thing catch on fire and then they lose all of the work. And I wasn't interested in that at all. Um, the panels that are dark blue on here, you can actually see will detach. So you can just pop them off, take the batteries out, charge it for the next time uh, and put it back in again. Um, and then the top level actually holds uh, an Arduino. And we haven't really talked about this, but from version two, there was an Arduino connected via serial to the Raspberry Pi. And that meant that the Arduino was the, uh, the controller of all of the servos. It controlled uh, the battery level. So you could get an input to an analog to detect the uh, amount of battery that was, that was currently running. And then um, it also meant that if I wanted to do anything else, I could use the Arduino to do that rather than having to have everything running off the Raspberry Pi because the Raspberry Pi is in the head. And if I have something running from the head down to the body, that's more wires and more complexity. So this was really just to try and simplify things. But the problem with version two was the Arduino was very dumb. It didn't do anything by itself. It just got commands from the Raspberry Pi through the serial connection. But the limit there was that meant you had to have the Raspberry Pi running all the time. It meant that, you know, if you needed to update the Arduino with a, a tweak or an adjustment of the code, it was a bit of a hassle. It just made everything much more complex. And also it meant if I wanted to take this thing to events, the battery really wouldn't last very long because of, as I've mentioned, that Raspberry Pi being quite power hungry. So for version three, I adjusted it a little bit. And what I've done is there is still an Arduino within that. And, but it can now run independently from the Raspberry Pi. So I can pop the front panel off and I can disconnect the Raspberry Pi's power. And then now all that'll happen is the, the uh, robot will continue to sit and stand and animate uh, and do everything that it would do while it was in its kind of rest mode um, or idle mode. Um, but it doesn't get signals from the Raspberry Pi to do face tracking. 
But that often doesn't matter if you're just looking to demo something and you're looking to kind of carry it around and show people for a number of hours. It meant that we didn't have that overhead of the Raspberry Pi running all the time. But then if the Raspberry Pi was connected, you could get the serial interrupting those automated um, movements on the Arduino and have it so it then effectively assumed control of the body uh, in order to track faces or in order to send its own animations. Uh, now that's something that has taken a while to get back up to the point of working and actually is, is currently kind of in final testing and, and will be merged to the repo uh, pretty soon. Um, one other thing that you'll notice on here is the uh, the Raspberry Pi has a little gray box or a silver box on the top of it, and that's actually a Coral USB accelerator. Now, I mentioned that the Raspberry Pi is quite slow in terms of face detection and facial recognition. Um, it isn't a problem, but the frame rate is quite low, which means that it isn't really particularly real time. So if you were to move from one side of the room to the other, it takes a little while for the thing to catch up. So I bought this USB accelerator so that, that actually handles the processing of those images and the identification of whether there are faces and where they are, which means that it's a lot faster. And the good news is because it's USB, I can plug it in when I want to use it, or if I don't want to use it, I can take it out. Um, and also so can everybody else. So although this is part of version three, it isn't something that's necessary in order to get up and running and building your own version with this. And then the final thing to mention is that the head is detachable. So you might see on the on our right, there is a capacitor and a little blue box sticking out the side. That's another uh, buck converter. And the idea there is that there is a buck converter in the body, which we've mentioned on that bottom level. And that's so that you can power the Arduino and power the servos from the power source. But there's also a connection of the original voltage going up to the head through the, the wires that are at the back of the neck. Um, but what you can do is you can just pop that head off and you can plug a completely different power source in, anything up to 20 volts, and this buck converter will handle that. So it means if you want to detach it and use it for other projects, you want to put it on a rover, you want to have it on your desk so that you can do some testing on the software without actually having the body doing its animations all the time, you can actually do that, and it, and it pretty much does it um, in real time. So it's a really useful thing in terms of accelerating the development and accelerating the, the work that you can do uh, when compared with version two, at least. Um, so we've got a few other images here, and then you can see this is it in action. And actually, this, this video in the center was something that I took today of it just kind of adjusting itself, getting ready to do some, um, some facial detection. So you can see the NeoPixels there changing color, where green means that it's detected my face, uh, and it starts out blue because it hasn't seen me yet because I was behind the camera. Um, and you can see that that auto shutdown button hanging off the side there. The head is obviously not complete. I need to design a, um, a better cover for that at some point. Um, so what are the use cases for something like this? Well, obviously it's a, it's a kind of demo project. It's a great learning experience for something. If you wanna try building something that's a little bit more substantial than maybe some of the guides that are available. Um, I use it as a desktop companion. That's the primary use. I'm still developing the software and there's gonna be a big rehash of the software in, in the future now that I've got this version built in terms of the hardware and the electronics and that kind of thing. Um, but one of the things that I've already mentioned is the idea of home security. You can set this thing away with the, the motion sensor and if it detects motion, it could maybe send you a message and record footage or send an image of whatever it detects. You could take it as far as uh, detecting a face or a motion of a, a person or a, an object moving around the room and actually focus on that and track it. Um, Similarly, you can have a dash cam. So you take the head off, you plug it into your uh, car and put it on your dash and you can have it recording footage. Uh, you could have it in the room while you're having a family event and have it record the event for you, either automatically or because you tell it, capture the memory that just happened. And you have a similar kind of dash cam functionality. Um, we already have time lapse in place. So it takes a, a series of photos and then it'll stitch those together into a video. Uh, assistants are obviously a big thing. Uh, it's limited without audio output, but I do have somebody else uh, who has another project where they do have um, uh, text-to-speech working on theirs as well. So you could do something similar to Alexa. And actually, I believe it's possible to put Alexa skills into to Python code as well. So you could actually integrate that sort of thing if you wanted to. 
Um, somebody had quite a novel idea of a, a pet watch. So if you have a dog uh, in the house and you want to see what it gets up to while you're away, you can have this thing take a look and track it as it walks around the various room. Um, and then we had someone who wanted to put a uh, light laser pen on the side of the head. And then when it detected a cat, it would start the laser pen up and actually make the cat chase the pen for entertainment while you are out, which is quite, a, quite an interesting idea. Um, an infrared emitter, well, I have another project where I actually programmed a, a gesture based remote. So that based on your gesture, it would output the signal to the TV and change the channel or whatever it might be. And obviously you could integrate something like that into this as well. And if you tell it to turn the TV on, it can look around until it finds the TV with object detection, and then it knows it's pointing in the right direction. We've also talked about ChatGPT. There are hopefully going to be another couple of talks in this session around ChatGPT integration. And we have somebody who's interested in working with that in order to, um, to have ChatGPT uh, integration into this project. Uh, and then one final thing was around having a time capsule. So you might record uh, some footage and have it played back to you a year and uh, any year's time or 10 years time or in the event of your untimely death or something like that. And these are all things that people have been talking about as ideas that they, uh, they could see happening. And that's just with the software and the hardware that we have at the moment. Uh, and obviously, if you wanted to add your own module, you could do that yourself. Now, in terms of the software, the structure of the Python that it's written in means that you can add modules quite easily and quite efficiently by just dropping a new module into the code and initializing it. And it uses Python PubSub in order to communicate between the modules. And we talked about that a little bit in the, in the last talk. Um, so yeah, there's quite a few options. Next steps for me, I'm looking to keep improving on the design. I'm not sure that it's maybe needs to be as big as it is. Uh, so I might start looking at kind of shrinking things down again, uh, just to find a happy medium between version two and version three. Um, I'd like to make it more accessible because I appreciate that although all of these parts are quite easy to manufacture, there are still a lot of parts and it's still quite a complex process. Uh, it's a good challenge for people, but it's possible that we can simplify things there. And then again, more modular. I'd like to ideally start integrating other technologies as well. I have somebody who's interested in using Jets and Nano. I'll talk to you about that in a second. Um, I've also just recently got a, a Pi Pico and these things can substitute the Raspberry Pi or the Arduino and we can create uh, PCBs to work with these different technologies so that you don't have to go out and spend money on something if you already have something else already. Uh, you can just print that PCB instead and then and then work with that technology instead. Um, so I wanted to mention the community. I've spent a couple of weeks going through and, and really fleshing out the wiki on the repository. Uh, so for those of you who don't know about GitHub, please get GitHub if you're writing code or some other version control. Um, you can go on, you can create a free account, you can create free repositories, which are locations where you store your source. Uh, and then you can also work in collaboration with other people. So you'll see here that when you go to the repository, it's not just me working on this. We have other people who are involved as well. Um, you can read through the wiki, which takes you through all of the process of creating the thing, of talking through um, how, do you, how do you install the software on the Raspberry Pi? How do you uh, install everything on the Arduino and get it all wired up together? And then if you want to build anything else, uh, how do you add your own modules? All of that stuff is included, and I will be building on it as I get more questions from people. Um, I do quite frequently get questions on the likes of Instagram and YouTube. I don't have the time to reply to everything. I have, you know, something like 14,000 followers on Instagram now, and it often gets to the point where I miss messages. But the community, the discussion groups, the issue tracker, this is where all of these conversations are going to start happening over the next few weeks, hopefully. Um, so it's a really good time. If you do want to get involved and you want to start, um, start helping out with either contributing to it or just building your own, uh, or you're building something similar and you want to go on the show and tell and talk to everybody about it, then please feel free to join. And I've got the, uh, the details of the various channels and, uh, and, and repositories down at the bottom there. Um, so one thing started happening around the time that I started creating version two, and that was that people really started to get interested in how it worked. And on YouTube, I started putting together a series of build videos, and those build videos were you know, as comprehensive as I could make it. 
And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I started getting messages from people who had actually started working on and building their own. And one of them of note was, was this guy who, without any previous interaction at all, uh, had started uh, and completed his own version. And he lived in Texas. And it was just great to see that he'd actually gone through and built this thing and used you know, similar technology, different servers, that kind of thing, um, to build his and then for uh, for version three, a few weeks ago, I was contacted by this guy who was living in Turkey, um, and he actually started making his own. But he's put a different spin on it. He has the Jetson Nano uh, in the head instead of the Raspberry Pi, which means he doesn't have the audio limitation. You can see there he started to put different technology in pretty much the whole thing. But he's also coming up with his own idea for modules, for RFID readers that would mean that only certain people could, could interact with it. Um, and other things like that. So it's really good to see that happening. And I'm really looking to encourage more of that uh, as we go on. Now, just give me one second. Um, yeah, so we are low on Q&A time, but I, are, are we waiting for somebody else to join still or are we good to go for the next call? So we are- um, uh, The next, person, next person is here, yeah. Excellent, okay, no problem. So uh, I will just quickly go through here. Um, I get asked quite a few questions, the most asked question that I get is, uh, no, the second most question I get asked, apparently, is does it pass butter? The most asked question I get is this, can it walk? And a lot of people are interested in this. There is nothing I would like more than to see this thing tap dancing around the room uh, and, and fetching me a drink on a hot day. Um, there is a lot to do between here and there, as, as many other people will be aware. Um, that said, be the change you want to see in the world. I'd love to have a community of people come together and make that happen with me. And I'm more than happy to support that, but it's not quite on the top of my list of priorities at the moment. Um, so that's everything from my side. Thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, shout up. Yeah, so we've got um, a few questions. Um, Mainly, this person on YouTube has a very similar question to me, you know, how do you get the inspiration for making it look so friendly and welcoming? You know, I think we all build robots and we have a good grasp on the technical side of things, but I think it's it's even more difficult to really look at the design aspect and say, how can I make this thing you know, technically viable, but also, you know, um, make it friendly looking and, and approachable? Yeah, well, to be honest, my my shortcoming is that I'm really not very good at, at designing for a form of a function. I'm very much the opposite. So what I what I have just tried to do is build something that I know will work, following that loose idea of having a bipedal robot that I quite like the look of. So really, it's very much just an essential thing and, and the limitation of my own abilities, to be honest. Okay, great. Yeah. So we, we are about at time for questions and the uh, time slot that you've taken that person has now turned up to give theirs who are actually doing perfect in terms of our Beautiful. schedule. But that was fantastic. That was an, an amazing robot. And uh, yeah, gosh, I'm, I'm trying to remind myself that I have other priorities because I want to build one myself. Um, <laughs> you are more than welcome. It's, it's really good. And again, it's re it speaks a lot. It speaks volumes when other people are going out of their way to reproduce it and can do so without having to ask for you for direct help. Uh, that really speaks to the quality of the work that's gone on. Um, Thank you. Right, let's hand over to uh, Niranj for a mini humanoid robot. Real, real quick, sorry, real quick. Yes, um, I, I pushed uh, Niranj to the end of the session because he's another 30 minute slot. So oh. uh, hopefully he'll be in the next 30 minutes. But, but that being said, our next presenter, Tommy, is also not here. Yeah, so, I mean, hopefully um, Keegan is going to join. He might be next. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, Naraj, if, if you're ready to go, I'm sorry for flip-flop, and, and I really appreciate your flexibility. No, so Michael, you chat with Naraj. I, I want to we'll ask do. Dan a couple more questions. Um, that sounds great, yeah. Uh, um, so, so it can't walk. Uh, it's currently stationary. It just sits on the desk. <laughs> that is correct, yes. Cool. It's, it, it's a 
it's a they challenge. Have no, no capability. So there's servos there in the legs. They're just not doing anything as of yet. The servos will animate, so you can make it move with the servos. What you can't do is make it take a step or turn in place. There are actually joints in the hips so that you can shift the center of gravity onto one leg, uh, but there are no servos attached to actuate those hip joints. So it is, it is closer than version two would have been, but there is still a lot of work to do, both in the form and also the code. And the perception as well. If you think it's fair enough to make it move, but you've actually got to make it understand the world and not just fall off the desk. So that's your, that's your big challenge there, I think. It sounds like a fantastic um, uh, foundation for a third year student robotics project who wants to finish off a university with a bank, build Definitely. that and then make it walk. Yeah, um, really fantastic Michael. stuff, yeah. Michael. Okay, well, um, so we don't have uh, Tommy or Emily here, but we do have Matt and Keegan. Um, Matt, if you're ready to present, we'd love to have you. Keegan, uh, if Matt's not ready, if you're ready to present, we'd love to have you too. I can do it, this is Matt. Cool. Okay, um, great. Let me start my video. And just checking everybody can hear me correct and see me. We can hear you and see you. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, let me share my screen. Give me one second. Actually, let me close a couple of windows. Okay, now share my screen. All right, let me start the slideshow. All right, and just ensuring everybody can see my, my screen, correct? Yes, we can. Awesome, okay. So my name is Matt. I'm the head of developer relations at a company called VM. Um, won't spend time talking about the company. If you saw Elliot's pre presentation earlier, that covers it really well. If not, definitely check it out. Um, and I'm going to be presenting my project that I call the Omnibot Mave. Um, Omnibot was a 1984 robot that was kind of at the time state of the art toy. Um, and what I did is I took it and I modernized it with VM and AI. Um, and so, yeah, for really anybody who's aware of kind of how the 80s felt or even, you know, looking back in history, how they, they might feel. Um, 80s was really a time of imagination when it came to robotics. Um, you know, it really started to give us a glimpse of like, how could these things, how could these robots actually interact with us, you know, in the future? Um, how might they be part of our lives? And for some of us, um, not all of us, they started to become a reality in our homes. Um, I actually never had the Omnibot as a kid, but um, I knew some that actually were lucky enough to have robots like it. Um, and it started to give us a glimpse of like what these could be. And yeah, why are, in my opinion, why are toy robots important? Um, they show us what's possible, right? Um, they're consumer items that are approachable for some people. Again, not everybody, but you know, they are kind of like leading the way in terms of getting new technology into our homes. And um, what's important about that is it's within constraints, right? Like these are mass manufactured things. They're not to, meant to be so expensive that they're not approachable. They're not, you know, the same as a robot in an MIT robotic lab by any mean. Um, so it's kind of showing like what's possible in real life for the end user. Um, and, you know, back then, Omnibot 2000, 1984, state of the art was essentially radio frequency remote control um, basic motor movements with remote with that remote control. And then they had some really kind of quirky um, programming with tape recorded audio commands um, and like a little digital display on the front. So let's fast forward to today. Uh, decades later, hardware is commoditized, right? I can go on to Amazon, I can go on to AliExpress and I can buy hardware that's actually pretty reasonable and and usable uh, for not too much money. Um, compute is small, inexpensive, whether you're using Raspberry Pi, Arduino, um, really any number of single board computers. Despite the last couple of years being more expensive due to supply chain issues, it's still pretty available 
um, and relatively inexpensive um, and powerful for what it is. Um, open source software is ubiquitous, right? Um, you know, in 1984, it was kind of just an idea. Um, today, in the programming language of your choice, you can pretty much find software that does almost anything you need. Um, and then you can compose it together to build what you want. Uh, and then cloud services are readily available. Um, you know, so that brings in things like data storage or machine learning, um, AI. Obviously, AI this year has taken a big leap forward. Um, and so all of this allowed me to take this 1984 robot and uh, rename it the Omnibot Mave. And I'm going to kind of walk you through the process and then give you a demo. So what did I want to do? What were my goals? Um, I wanted to reuse as much of the original equipment as possible. Um, so right now I'm using all of the original motors as loud and as like not great as they actually are, but they work. Um, and I wanted to add programmatic control, true programmatic control. Um, so I could choose you know, any programming language and start actually programming this robot to you know, have control loops or interact with things in my house. Um, I wanted to add a secure internet communication protocol so that I could control this thing, whether I'm at home or maybe at the office or somewhere else. Um, maybe I could have it, you know, as mentioned earlier in the last presentation, like watch my cat or make sure my cat is not jumping on tables, which is a constant problem. Um, upgraded sensors. So I added a camera. Um, I added a um, power sensor. I added ultrasonic. So this way the robot can actually interact with the world and do more interesting things. Um, and computer vision, machine learning, AI. I'll talk a bit about those more in a minute. Um, and I wanted to make all of this open source and reusable. Um, everything that I was using, um, I want to be able to reuse those things on other robots. Any code that I wrote um, shouldn't be specific necessarily to this robot. Um, I wanted to do all this in, in honestly just a few days. Um, and so, yeah, is this retrofitting? Um, is it upcycling? Is it a resto mod? And if you're not familiar with that term, it's used in uh, the car world. You might take like a 1960s um, car, a 1980s BMW, and put new technology in it. Um, keep it with the same look, but you know, change what's inside. I think it's all of the above. Um, for this project, I spent less than five hundred dollars. Um, the vast majority of that was the Omnibot itself at about $250 on eBay, um, and then the Raspberry Pi. Everything else was pretty inexpensive, um, and I'll walk you through that. Whereas the original price of Omnibot adjusted for inflation was you know, almost $2,000. It was $600 in 1984. Um, so I was able to keep on a pretty decent budget um, and get a lot out of it. Um, but before I get into how I did this, um, just want to mention, uh, I am not a roboticist. Uh, I spent my entire career building software and, you know, building some pretty cool applications, some less cool than others. But um, until fairly recently, I had not dealt much with hardware. Um, so this brought up questions. Um, I want to use a motor. How do I interface with it? I want to use a sensor. How do I interface with it? Um, you know, depending on the type of sensor, you probably know that there is a very different interface. And, you know, sometimes it's, you know, serial based or whatever it might be, but you're accessing registers and you're doing it kind of a different way, sensor to sensor, um, sometimes even motor to motor. I wanted to use machine learning to detect things around uh, with images from a webcam. How do I do that? Um, securely control my robot from somewhere else. Um, how do I do that? And as mentioned before, like I don't want to relearn this for every robot, from robot to robot. Like I, I kind of want to learn it one time, like get that skill set under my belt, and uh, then be able to build more robots. Um, and so I started by opening up the robot, and here you can see it. To me, this kind of reminds me of a scene from Star Wars, um, where you know the robots taken apart into a million pieces. Um, and like I said, I reused the original motors. Um, there were two motors in the base um, and one DC motor. Again, these are basic DC motors, no encoders um, in the head. So you could actually turn the robot's head back and forth. Um, and I added a Raspberry Pi. I added um, a couple motor controllers, uh, H-bridge motor controllers. 
and I have a 12 volt lithium battery. I also have a battery uh, control module so that actually I can't overcharge it. Hopefully it's pretty safe, um, but I'm reusing actually the existing barrel jacks that were built into the Omnibot and as well as some of the switches. So now I can actually just use the original power switch, turn it on. I can externally plug in a power source. I can use the battery that's, you know, in the original battery compartment. Um, and so hardware wise, like, you know, it took a little time to put this all together. Um, but again, the software was kind of, you know, potentially the hard part. And so I use the VM platform. Now, maybe that's obvious. I work at the company VM, but I'll kind of walk you through what I did. So um, for each component, I, you know, went in, I said, okay, I have a motor, let's call it base L because it's the left motor on the base. Um, it's connected to a Raspberry Pi that I've configured already. Um, and then I'm most importantly specifying which pins on the Raspberry Pi these things are connected to. And then I can go ahead and test. And so at this point, I'm actually gonna flip over to a demo. And before I do that, um, I'm gonna try joining the Zoom from my phone as well because I have that pointing at the robot. So I don't know, let's see how well that works. Give me one second. Oh, I'm actually in the wrong session. This is the robot arm session. Hold on. Okay. One second. I think I found the right link. Okay. Okay. Um, and now you should all be able to see the robot. Um, let me know if you can, and um, Reddit team, if you can maybe switch. Maybe I should turn off my. So you're you unmuted your phone, but it's not showing any video. But it's not. Hold on a second. There we go. Now we got it. Okay, is it pointing at me or is it pointing at the robot? It's pointing at me. It right? is pointing at the robot. Um, you may have to stop sharing your screen for just a moment um, for everyone to see it. Okay. There we go. Okay, now it's front and center. I'll actually turn off my video as well, um, and then I'll go back to sharing the screen. Okay. Um, that so should show up as the main thing. Okay, can you see both my screen and the robot now? Um, let's see. Yes, but I'm not sure how to do that for the uh, live stream. The live stream defaults to whatever uh, screen is being shared. So you may just have to switch back and forth between sharing and not sharing your screen so that the uh, YouTube stream can can see it. Um, okay, not sure how to do that, honestly, because um, again, one is just like video through my phone and then through my other, you know, I'm, I'm trying to share my desktop through my laptop. Yeah. Um, if you stop sharing your screen on your desktop, then that'll make the video on your phone show up larger for everyone on the live stream. Okay, but you can see both right now. It's just the robot is smaller. Yes, yeah, but that's oh, correct. Got it. got it, okay. So yeah, let me let me run through a quick demo here. Um, first, I'll show you how to set up, how I set this up, testing remote control. Um, so, you know, here I have my robot. It is a robot configured in VM, um, and I have the various components. So. Raspberry Pi, um, I have the various motors. Um, and as mentioned before, I can flip over and just start controlling these different things. So um, here's the head motor. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on. Okay, so you saw the head move. Um, I can switch directions, of course, and run it again. Great, okay. 
And I could do the same with these motors, but I'll also show you, um, I have a webcam set up. Um, so here it's actually looking at the back of my chair where I'm sitting here. Hello, everybody. Um, and I then have the ability to control um, the motors as a unit, essentially, because I have a base component set up that specifies the different motors. So here, I'm going to actually, one second, unplug from 12 volt, volt power supply. Um, and I'm going to start driving the robot around. And you can see, you know, it's seeing in real time, um, streaming with the webcam, seeing my office. Um, and so essentially, yeah, as I was setting up the robot, component by component, I just, you know, hardware, plugged it into the wires, um, configure, tested. Um, and now I can actually start doing some interesting things. So um, I mentioned before, I want programmatic control. So let's say I want to you know, drive my robot in a square. Um, I have some sample code here where essentially I'm just acquiring um, the ro robotic base as a resource. Um, I have this function called move in square. It's really very straightforward. And I'm just calling base move straight and then base spin. And um, that completes the square. So if I want to go ahead and run that right now, you should see the robot go ahead and drive in a square, hopefully not bump into anything. OK, so there we go, roughly drove in a square. Um, so that's cool. I have motor control programmatically. I can do this through, you know, in this case, I'm using Python. If I wanted to use another programming language, I, I could. Um, but, you know, now I have this 1984 robot with true programmatic control, um, whereas previously it would rely on radio frequency control. And in fact, like when I bought this on eBay, it didn't have the remote control included with it. Um, OK, great. So now. Um, I wanted to add the ability to control the robot with my voice or and actually talk out loud to me. So I went ahead and I created this module that I'm calling speech. And, you know, this is open source. I'll share this afterwards. But essentially, it has just a few methods. Um, one is a say method. So I can pass in some text and the robot will say things out loud. Um, I have a USB speaker plugged in. Um, I also hooked this up to open AI and, and chat GPT. So I was just at the ICRA robotics conference last week in London and, you know, really big contrast for anybody who's there between this year and last year is that lots of robots were connected in their demos to chat GPT. So I actually wanted to build into this module, um, the ability to connect to open AI or any other provider. Um, today it's just open AI. Um, but I wanted to make this whole speech module, something that could be drop, you know, drop in ready to any robot. So I'm going to demo on the Omnibot, but, you know, this should be able to work with really any robot so that you're not having to figure out these things like robot to robot. Um, and then finally, I have this git commands um, uh, feature, which actually what it does is if I'm talking to my robot, it will convert speech into text and then it will make things available in a buffer. So then programmatically, I can get the commands and actually, you know, based on what I'm saying, have the robot do different things. So um, do a couple little demos here. First, um, oh, I wanted to show this. Um, this is all also configurable. So here I'm saying, you know, the persona that I want this robot to work as is a robot helper. Um, the speech provider, I could use Google. I'm using Eleven Labs. It has more interesting voices. And the voice that I'm using is Antony. Um, I have listening on. So the robot actually is waiting for keywords. Um, I'm using the default keywords, which you can see in the code. Um, actually, here you can see it. Um, default keywords are, I'm not going to say it out loud because then the robot would hear me. But um, essentially, if I say these things, it will do one of these actions. Um, so let me just go ahead and start demoing it. Um, here's the code that I'm go going to demo right now. Um, in this case, I'm actually using a machine learning model um, that's looking for a person. And so what I'm doing here is I'm going to you know, just have this endless control loop that first blinks the robot eyes. Um, then it's going to look for things. Look for things is actually just a function that goes ahead and um, it gets an image from the webcam I have configured. 
it passes it to the VM vision service. Um, the uh, machine learning model that I have here is like a very basic one that you can find online. It's like a common one that everybody uses. I think it uses ImageNet. Um, and then I'm getting detections. If the detections are one of the things that I'm looking for, in this case, a cat or a person, I do have a cat. I doubt my cat will show up for this demo today, but um, I'm here. And if it sees me, it's going to actually, you know, use uh, the speech module to do a completion, um, meaning it's going to send this text to uh, ChatGPT and it's going to say the response out loud. So let's try this. Let's we'll start running the code now. Okay, it's connecting to the robot. Good day, friend. Okay, right. It's a good day, friend, which is the first thing here. Okay. Um, it's actually having a problem connecting to the robot. Give me one second. Of course, something has to go wrong in every demo. Hmm. Let me try running it again. Good day, friend. Okay, now, yeah, I think it's running correctly. So I'm actually going to go in front of the robot so it sees me. It's great to see you too, human. How can I assist you today? Okay, great. So it saw me and it actually sent that text to ChatGPT for completion. And then you heard the response. So pretty cool. Um, and the last demo I have today, um, I'm going to show you um, essentially uh, waiting for a command. So um, before I do that, I have it set up in listen mode. And so I can do things like, hey, robot, say hello. Should say hello. Didn't. Hey, robot, say hi. Hi. There you go. Sometimes, uh, depending on the microphone, it doesn't pick up or it doesn't translate the text. Um, but anyway, that works. Okay, great. So now um, I'm actually going to start running this code again, just another like never ending loop um, where it's listening for commands move forward and move backwards. Um, again, my trigger for those is, um, let's see, I have the default trigger command, which is right here. So I'm going to start running the code. And if it hears me say one of these things, it should actually um, you know, do as I expect. So let's try it. Okay, it's connecting. It should be connected. Hey, robot, can you move forward? Great. Hey, robot, can you move backwards? Hey, robot, can you move backwards? That's not hearing me. Hey, robot, can you move backwards? I don't have a physical form, so I can't move forwards or backwards. However, if you're referring to a specific robot, it depends on the robot's design and capabilities. Some robots can move backwards while others cannot. Can you please specify which robot you are referring to? Robot, can you move backwards? There we go. I think the problem was I was actually saying, hey, robot, which triggered a completion. Um, okay, great. So um, that's the end of my demo. I actually have room for questions. And uh, again, like all of this is open source. Um, I actually wrote a tutorial about like how to set all this up. Like um, all of you can get the links, basically like all the hardware that I used and the really fun project. But, you know, my hope is that, you know, other retro robots get retrofitted in the future. And like some of these speech capabilities <laughs> that I built modularly will you get used with other robots. So thank you so much. And um, yeah, happy to take any questions. Yeah.
Man, that was fantastic. Um, the the auto response had some real open the pod bay doors vibes. <laughs> Talking about robots with no physical form, and you know, please specify which robot. That was really funny. <laughs> yeah, um, and and you're the first person to make the connection between retro modding for cars, which um, I'm surprised more people in the robotics industry don't have. Um, you know, a f um fondness for but um uh certainly yeah retro modding i can see the same thing applied to robotics now and going forward you know one day we'll revisit pepper when they're just you know lying on the scrap heap we can pick them up and see what we can do with them yeah exactly i mean this robot was probably sitting in somebody's garage for the past 20 years and, and sure some people would say well you should have as a collector's item like kept it that way but um honestly now it's like a, a fun toy and a development robot for me yeah it's way cooler it was also really nice to see you know earlier we had elliot talk about kind of the high level vm stuff you know kind of what what you can do with vm for any robot and it's really nice to sit here and look at okay here's what i used it for for this robot and seeing you know what's possible you know with the platform integrating chat gpt and everything is just it's a really cool thing to do i mean do you think there would be so right now using chat gpt purely for completion right you're asking it a question and then it's replying with an answer generated by chat gpt is there any you know thought in the future you could integrate that with um you know generating commands for the motors like you say move like this and ask ChatGPT, you know, generate a series of motor commands that would move like this or something like that. I think so. I think it would probably work pretty well. Um, you know, our documentation is fairly complete right now. And um, so yesterday I was, I was testing that a little bit. And actually, um, one of the calls that you can make to any robot that's running VM is essentially describe yourself, like give me the list of all the components and services. And, oh, yeah. and so I actually like passed that to chat GPT with a completion request and also told it to look at docs.vm.com and then tell me about itself. <laughs> and actually like it worked pretty well. And then I was having oh. fun, like I was doing it as like um, a robotic uh, killer machine <laughs> to hear it like talk about itself in that light. And so not that I wish for those in the world, but um, And yeah. you as a robot therapist, tell me about yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, but no, it's it's, it's pretty amazing what these LLMs can do and like how, you know, they're opening the box for so many things. And, you know, obviously one common complaint is that, you know, they're not always accurate. Um, so yeah, we have to be careful about how we use them. But then again, like humans are not always accurate. And really it's, you know, with LLMs, it's really like all the information aggregated. And, and so I, I know we're not here to talk about like the morals and the ethics behind open, you know, open AI and other AI solutions, but um it definitely opens up possibilities. Absolutely, yeah. It's interesting to see. I, I certainly think at the moment, you know, it's a it's a powerful new tool, and we're we're kind of swinging it around, not quite sure when it's doing damage or when it's making things better, sort of thing. Yeah, you know, very much. Yeah, uh, yeah. Think, yeah. Figure it out. You know, when when the monkey first discovers fire, they're liable to burn themselves a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And and that's kind of like why I've been focusing on just using it for a human computer interface and not like really, you know, not that the Omnibot's going to hurt anybody. It's not powerful enough to do so. But, you know, I'm not giving it free reign at the moment to like have complete control over robots, more just like, you know, so I can talk to it and it can, you know, translate and do things without me having to code too much. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We do have one question from the chat which was asking what software did you use for the electrical layout uh, diagram that you generated? Was it you know, Photoshop or did you use some kind of software to make that? Yeah, good good question. So I actually, I know it doesn't look like it because it's, oh, it's, it's a convoluted answer. Um, I use Fritzing, which a lot of people use, um, but then we have a graphic design person, Christina, who's amazing at VM. And she actually like, she's building out her own component library that is, you know, composable. And she basically at the moment will, you know, take any one of my diagrams and convert it into something like more visually appealing. Um, I'll have to talk to her about if that would be made open source because it really does. It, it, it's great diagrams like with her flair on it. So yeah. That'd be super cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Would certainly yeah. add to uh, Viam's approach of having hardware 
if you are able to identify the image too, as well as you know the uh, just component name. Um, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of human hands involved. I don't know the specifics. Yeah, I mean, as Elliot mentioned earlier, like we we have like this concept of APIs, and like any number of components can fit into those APIs, and you know who's doing the work today. It's like VM engineers, but soon we're opening it up for anybody and. Um, you know, my job as a developer advocate is fun because I actually like get to build things that show how people how it's possible, but then also like, I want to contribute things. So like what I just showed that speech module, it's very much like alpha, literally I built it in the past couple of days and I was hoping I'd have it ready in time for this presentation, but, um, nice. you know, I think it could be something that people could contribute to and like, could be actually quite useful. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for presenting. Again, this is a fantastic project and it's just so cool to, you know, see the progress of robotic toys, you know, what's possible now versus back in the 80s. So thank you very much. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Here's some more retro mod robots. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, next up, we have uh, Keegan, who people may remember from last year. He presented uh, an earlier version of this robot last year, and he's here with us today to present the uh, most current version. So Keegan, whenever you're ready, please take it away. Hey folks. Um, yeah, so just to go back to uh, what Matt was saying, I do have a, a classic mini literally sat behind me waiting to be uh, uh, heavily upgraded once funds allow it. So yeah, definitely wanna go electric with that at some point. So the retro modding, definitely my thing. So, um, we are not here to talk today about my mini. We had here to talk about um, any five. So I will hopefully have these slides working. And of course it's lost my screen. Share screen, there we go. That one, right, share. Sorry about this folks. Right, so, um, yeah, that's me. So this is any five version one. Um, this was the one that I entered to Pi Wars 2020. So this is the one I got started with. And um, it looks very similar to the one I've got now. Um, but yeah, it's <laughs> skin deep is about as, as far as similar similarities go. So you can see it's got tracks there. It's using um, kind of hobby servos. I think those were MG. 996Rs, um, so you could tell them what position to go into, but you didn't get any feedback back. You didn't get any feedback. So they, they were good, but when you switch them on, they'd just go clunk to wherever they wanted to be. And if you had a servo that kind of stalled, it would just sit there and stall until it melted through the hot glue that was holding it in place and the arm fell off which was turned out to be quite a nice little uh, safety feature, the hot glue. Um, it was just originally a bit of a hack, but you know, needs must and all that sort of stuff. So back then he was using a stereo Pi. So that is um, a compute module uh, free based board, that one. There's a bunch of them that compute module, module four now as well. Um, uh, yes, hello, waving. Um, and yeah, that was, um, it worked, you know, it, it was of its time. It was based on a Raspberry Pi, which was required for the Pi Wars competition this was originally built for, uh, but it it was definitely struggling. So I could get about 18 frames per second when I was trying to generate depth maps and the, uh, the resolution on it was about 320 by 240 per eye. And it, it was generally not great. And I've seen people do fantastic things with the stereo Pi boards. So it was almost certainly down to my coding, but um, brute force in hardware is sometimes useful, as I think Matt also alluded to. So through time, he, he kind of got upgraded bit by bit until the latest version. So the Mark III, I have to remember to look at a different camera now. Um, so this is uh, very similar to as it was. The, the biggest change, is uh, Dynamixel servos. So where before it had very limited range because it was, I think it was like 90 degree servos in most of the places. Um, I haven't got it working yet, but it does have enough dexterity to pat himself on the back. Um, and at some point, um, 
he will be able to do some party tricks because why not? Um, so these are Dynamics or servos, um, which if you're not familiar with them, they are a smart servo. Um, I think each one of these has a Cortex M0 in it or something daft like that. So you can communicate with them. You can get feedback from them, both in positional, how much power it's using. Uh, from the power, you can calculate torque. You can also set limits on um, either velocities or power or there's loads of stuff that I've not even scratched the surface on yet, but um, they're, they're really cool for the fact that they can't, they know where they are. And if they, they jam up, they will literally go into a hard stop mode and just the arms will collapse. And yeah, um, it's a bit of a surprise when it happens, all of a sudden the robot's arms just drop dead, but um, it, it's better that than you burning the servos out and having to replace them all, which is never ideal. So uh, the other big changes, um, it's still got the same compute module in the back. It's just connected to a baseboard. Um, it does have an NVMe hard drive because it had a slot, so I thought I'd use it, um, which is ridiculous, but it's great for a swap file when you're doing builds. Um, and the vision system has been replaced with, um, and yeah, magnetic enclosure catches. It's the biggest thing I'm happy about from this because it makes it so easy to get in and out of things. But um, rather than the stereo pie it had before, it now has a Luxonis Oak FFC 3P uh, vision processing module. Um, don't say that three times fast, you will fall over. And what this has is the ability to connect three cameras, hence the 3P. Um, they've got four camera and six camera versions as well, I think. Um, so you can do all sorts of funky 360 degree. 360 degree detection. Um, but it also has the vision uh, processing units. Uh, of, and basically, I think it's got four tera operations per second or something that, like that. So it can do all of the processing needed on board to generate the depth maps, to do object detection, to do a lot of other stuff that I've not even thought about yet. And then send only that data to the Pi. So the Pi isn't being swamped with all of the pixels, most of which you'll have to ignore, um, but you can set it up however you want. So you can actually just stream a, a live video image through um, if you just want to remote control it for teleoperation. Or you can do the 3D depth maps and all sorts of stuff. <clears throat> um, the reason I didn't go for just the looks on its um, Oak cameras or a uh, connect or something like that is uh, something Dan alluded to. And that is the aesthetics. So it, it's, there's, there's an obvious resemblance to, uh, to Johnny Five here. In fact, I even took the CAD model from Input Inc's um, Johnny Five CAD model to extract all of these components, generate a mesh and just add them up top there just for, to, for a bit of an effect. So I'm balding myself. So I figured I'd, I'd give him a bit of something up top just to, I don't know make up for, for my lack of follicles. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the aesthetic. I, I wanted him to be friendly, um, and he is him because he's Johnny Five, and it, it's just kind of a holdover from that. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of the uh, the the big features here. Um, I don't know if the old one had the mechanum wheels. I think he, they did have those last year as well. Um, but yeah, so... Last year, for various reasons, he wasn't working at all, I don't think. Um, this time around, um, he can at least wake up and uh, stretch a bit. So um, I've not got full manual control over the arms yet, um, but he can move himself around, which is a big plus. And as you saw there, he did just pick his arms up straight away. Um, so rather than just jerking in position, position, it says, right, where are my arms? Okay linear interpolation from that to the start position and then so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, with the mechanism wheels, and please note and learn from my mistakes, um, I do have uh, bash bars front and back of this, this table. Um, and I was operating him initially on his little throne. I recently did a demo in front of a customer and he, he skewed off sideways. Um, because with, like I say, with the mechanism wheels, he can just go left to right um, and literally disappeared off the table under the sofa. And I found him feeling sorry for himself, lying on his side, staring mournfully up at somebody next to their desk. 
Um, they had a sense of humor, thankfully. So, uh, but yeah, wasn't an, an ideal impression, but they, they knew the, the problems of the, uh, the curse of the live demo and all that. So um, as I was saying with the Mechanum wheels, um, and I'm using my custom controller for this as well. So it's based off a, um, runs on a Raspberry Pi. Um, it's themed around one of the industrial controllers you see for um, remote control cranes and things like that, just because I'm a massive nerd, unsurprisingly, and I, I love cranes. Um, so I just thought I'd design it on that, that idea. Um, it does have um, strap points as well, if you want to have it hanging from a neck strap. So you can actually operate these a bit easier because they are three axis joysticks, which uh, does make controlling the arms that bit easier, but also for, for, for the mechanism side of things. So um, you can uh, rotate left and right, disappear out of frame. Come on, come back. Um, and yeah, basically you've got full holonomic control over the, the flat surface. So um, for Pi Wars this year, one of the challenges was picking fruit from a tree. It was all themed around agriculture. Um, and this was really handy because he could essentially orbit around this tree and just pick the apples off, put them into the basket and then kind of carry on to the next one. And uh, um, it was really handy for that. And yeah, that, that's kind of the, the robot as he is right now. Um, some of the other things I've been working on are, well, the big, biggest thing I've been working on of late is uh, getting the arm control working in uh, MoveIt, which is a path planning system for ROS, um, so that I can actually have full um, inverse kinematic control for the arms. Um, that can then also hook into a perception module, so you can do pick and place. Um, again, for next year's competition for Pi Wars, there's a, a barrel sorting competition, um, which I'm not in it yet, you know, but I'm, I'm fingers crossed I will be. Um, but yeah, you, there's toxic waste spillage. There's uh, two different types of barrels that you've got to sort into different areas. <clears throat> and yeah, um, so yeah, I'm hoping I can automate an awful lot of that. Um, this is finally becoming more and more actually open source. I said it was last year and that it was going to be open source when... Um, the code and CAD models were less embarrassing. And then I realized if I wait until my code's less embarrassing, I'll never publish it. <coughs> Excuse me. So if you go to, uh, I think they'll share the links afterwards, but uh, github.com forward slash Nevenge forward slash NE5. Um, all of the code is up there. Most of the development is happening on the um, noetic hyphen devl branch at the minute. So that's the one that's actually active. Um, and yeah, it's it's slowly being fleshed out with with everything that you can see here, and more will be added over time. The the CAD model, there's a few more things I want to tweak over the course of next week, just to tidy up um, the uh, cable management and to strengthen a few parts. But then all of the STLs and the step files for that will be published as well. Um, I think that's my ten minutes. I don't know when I stopped. My my phone literally just died, and it said, "Oh, it's quarter past nine, and then it just died. So <laughs> that was a nice timer, if, if un, unintentional. But um, no, you're good. You're you're totally right on time. Um, we just have a few a questions. Rare occurrence, yeah. incredibly rare yeah. occurrence. <laughs> no, you're totally <laughs> good. Um, can, I, can I ask quickly? And again, really nice to have you back to give an update on it. Really great to see the progress of this robot, and it feels like it's matured a lot and become a lot more robust since the last iteration and seeing a demo live you know you know congrats well done all the, the hard work pays off and all those great things yeah so have, yeah, absolutely yeah have you considered if you want to enter the pie wars competition partnering with a you know a secondary school or a sixth form or a university perhaps so there are there is, there is a kind of, it's, Pi Wars is split into two parts. So day one is um, youth teams and school teams. And then the second day is um, everyone else, basically. Uh, either people who uh, have, have technically grown up or who are technically professionals. Um, sadly, I come into that latter category. So I'm with the rest of the advanced teams now. Um, uh, the, the university side of things, I'm definitely trying to get hold of people who might be interested in using this for teaching and things like that. Um, the I've not added it up recently because, frankly, it's a little terrifying, but, but um, only because it's out of my own pocket. <coughs> but the um, total cost for this is probably somewhere in the region of um, fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred pounds, which for a small mobile robot with a decent vision system and two seven degree of freedom arms, 
I don't think that's too unreasonable amount of money. Um, but for what it is, it's a perfect price point. The question then is, what's your application? Yeah. Because if you can find the application that matches this, it's ideal at that kind of cost. Yes. So for teaching um, telepresence applications, you've got pick and place type yeah. things, which I'll be doing yeah. through uh, PyWars as well, and and things like that. So through PyWars and through me messing around doing my own stuff, because I, I do have a VR headset waiting for the 3D depth maps for, for this, because I used to do a unit of development um, in a former life. So I'm, I'm very keen to get telepresence working in VR um, and to hit some of the issues of latency, no doubt. But I've already got a few ideas for that. But um, yeah, so it's I, I want to make it as versatile as possible, uh, partly because it's for me to play with, but also it's a kind of a portfolio piece for, for me as a, an engineer. Um, so yeah, I, I technically quit my job not long after um, Pi Wars and started a robotics company. And I've had exactly one robotics um, contract in almost three years now, but I've been having software engineering stuff. Um, the most notorious contract, software contract I had recently was um, I rewrote the ground systems for a satellite, which then exploded um, after being launched from Cornwall in January. So that was a little bit disheartening because we were really looking forward to seeing that in orbit, needless to say. But um, yeah, so I, I do a lot of different things. So this is also ideal for that because you've got the 3D modeling, you've got the software engineering, you've got the engineer, um, electronics and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to lie. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's it, right here. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're not having fun with it, I mean, you know, all, all work is work at the end of the day. And anyone who says, have a job you'll love, love you'll never work a day in your life. Oh, they need a slap. I mean, if you have a job you love, you will work yourself to death because you won't realize how hard you're working. So you need to have fun with it. That's that's definitely something that needs to, to be a part of it. Yeah, so. of course. Yeah. But one of the questions from the chat um, is, uh, you know, which Dynamixels are you using? Uh, have you had any issues with internal gear stripping, servos breaking, any quality issues with those? So um, I'm using a mix of two different types of Dynamixels there, the XL and the XC series. Um, uh, the difference is um, 22 versus 88. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm very dusty in the garage at the minute. <coughs> um, yeah, the difference between the two servos nominally is um, 22 pounds versus 88 pounds. And when you've got 19 servos or whatever it is on here, they, they add up. So I have some of the, um, the higher cost ones. I can't remember which one it is. They're, they're the, they run at 11 volts. Um, they've got metal gears, um, so the, the shoulder joints all the way down to the elbow are using the, the higher power ones. I think it's um, around 11 kilogram centimeters of torque, uh, 0.98 newton meters, I think. Um, and the, the rest of them run at around five volts, and they've got half of that. But again, once you've got past the elbow, the leverage kicks in, and they're not going to be picking up much anyway. So yeah. Um, Oh, yeah, and I've also got three of the five-volt ones for the head mechanism as well, so we can actually tilt sidewards. Basically, I, I added the tilt function because I can imagine if he's done something stupid or once I've got the, the voice recognition in there, if he doesn't understand, I just want him to look at you up at you like a confused dog and kind of cock his head to one side. It's like, what? Yeah. Um, but uh, again, I want to put as many kind of behaviours into it as I can um, just so yeah, people yeah. respond to it a bit more naturally. Um what, the only issue I've really had with the servos um, was just bad luck. And all of the 11 volt servos all the way down to the elbows, um, they, I just had a batch where they would overheat. Um, you just switch them on and, and with these servos, you can you give them power and then they just sit there and do nothing until you enable talk. So, you know, the, it's not like with a lot of hobby servos where you switch them on and they immediately try and go to a position. Bad luck can be more common than it should be with Dynamix or servos. In right. Yeah. Well, like I say, I, I didn't want to speak um, ill of them needlessly, but yeah, only with my from my uh, experience have I done that. But yeah, it's your mileage may vary by the sounds of things. But yeah, so they, they just sit there and slowly overheat and get into like the 50s and the 60s um, Celsius. That is um, one of them would actually get to like 72 degrees and then just shut Ooh. down. That's hot. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And 
I mean, fair play to it, it did shut down. And because it shut down, that was how I knew I had a problem. So I then wrote a little bit of software to kind of constantly monitor the temperatures across them. Um, yeah, and, and I got them replaced. Um, they, there were stock issues, unfortunately. So it took a while to get them back. But yeah, that's um, other, other than that, um, the SDK is being a bit annoying. It works, but the... Um, the Dynamixel workbench um, package for ROS, which presents itself uh, in a ROS way so you can send messages to them from it and things like that. Um, yeah. I expected to be able to put, plug that directly into Move It, and I probably can, but I just can't figure out for the life of me how. Um, so if anyone has done that, please send a message through the organizers and I will be in your debts, I assure you. But um, yeah. It's, I've been trying to do things in a more proper way, um, like getting the, <clears throat> the robot definition file sorted out so that I can just plug it into things like uh, move it and it can do all the path planning. And it's still a bit of a slog. As you can see, I can move the, the arms around manually, no problem. But again, once I want to start doing like the inverse kinematics, which on arms with seven degrees of freedom can be an absolute nightmare and maths is not my forte. So I really want to get that working so that it can just sort itself out and I don't of have course, to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, other, other than that, they've, they're, yeah, they, they work really well. I mean, the, the fact you can get the, put them into different modes. So you've some of these, um, obviously the elbows have got limits there. Well, well the limits are further than my arm because it can actually carry on going underneath. Um, and you can set limits so it doesn't hit itself. But with the shoulder yeah. piece, for example, it can actually go all the way around, pretty much only limited by the, the wiring. Um, and you can put it into position mode where it's zero to 360 degrees or multi-turn mode, and it'll just carry on going and connect like a motor, essentially. So they're, cool. they're very versatile in that regard. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, I think that's all the time we have, unfortunately, for uh, your presentation. Yeah. but. Thank you again for another great presentation this year. Uh, we really enjoyed your one last year. This one's even better. You know, the live demo was fantastic. Um, well, and, third time's uh, a charm, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, live demos are always just cursed, unfortunately. I mean, they're cursed to, to, to do something wrong. But yours turned out great. So thank you very much. Yeah, you've said it now. It's going to catch fire as soon as I turn the camera off. Uh, well, <laughs> okay, if it does, please send us a video so we can at least show our audience. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. As long as you can get some advertising out of it, it's not a failure, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Never mind. Um, well, yeah, thanks well, for having me, folks. And like I say, the links everywhere. Uh, just search for Neve Engineering, and I should turn up. So absolutely, yeah. I mean, you're also very active in the uh, Discord. So if anyone wants to join the Robotics Discord, um, they can talk to you there as well. So, yeah, wonderful. All right. Well, next up we have uh, Naranj. Are you on Naranj? Yeah. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you great. Am I visible? Is my video up here? Yes. Yep, your video is here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sorry for missing the schedule a uh, little bit earlier. Uh, there were some technical problems with uh, the app I am using. So let me start my presentation right now. Please go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Niranj. I'm from India, and I just recently graduated from high school. So I was watching the earlier presentations and they are really, really great. I'm really inspired from them. So compared to that, my project is a little bit small. It's a small, uh, robust project. So sorry for that. And uh, let me start the presentation. Let me share my screen here. Wonderful. Yeah, can you see that screen I'm sharing? Yep, we can see it. Yeah, okay, so this is my robot. Uh, it's called Momentum. I have named it Momentum, as you can see. It's a humanoid robot. Uh, so uh, I actually built this robot for my final year school exhibition. And so I'm a uh, beginner for at robotics. So this is my first robot, actually. Uh, I have made other robots, but they don't even have a microcontroller. So they cannot really be called robots. They just have some motors and some wires and switches and all. So this is my first robot. 
So while making this robot, I had a very tight budget. I think it was 5,000 Indian rupees. Uh, I think that that means uh, less than 100 US dollars. Uh, so I, I, I knew Python. Uh, I had an Arduino, but I could not afford uh, to buy a Raspberry Pi. So I was searching for a way to code Python using Arduino. Uh, and eventually I found a library called PyFermata. Uh, that library, it uh, let me use uh, the Arduino like a Raspberry Pi, uh, except that I have to always connect it to my computer. So that was not a problem. So the body uh, looks like it's made with some 3D printing material, but no, it's actually made manually from a material called Forex. Each part is cut manually and glued together. It, it uses 12 servo motors for motion. And for the camera, it uses an old uh, webcam. Uh, inside, the webcam was dismantled and uh, fitted inside is its head, uh, along with two these two LED lights, as you can see. And so I did my best to keep things inside the budget. Did a lot of uh, shortcuts to uh, make things cheap. And to maintain balance, as it that it doesn't have any uh, balance system, so I put these uh, yellow little yellow batteries for uh, making it uh, stopping it from falling when it is walking. And the physical part was very tough to make because uh, this was my first time making such a thing, and I I had I, I had no uh, planning whatsoever beforehand, so. Uh, there was a lot of mistakes and uh, repetitions. So eventually I uh, got, got it right, got it balanced, and then I moved on to software. And software was also the machine learning and all. It was the first time coding machine learning. So actually uh, this robot has uh, a web camera. So I have coded a machine learning program that can track the user's face and it will follow their face around the room and it can track hand gestures and moves the robot's hand accordingly. And it can also be controlled through social media apps actually like WhatsApp and Discord. Uh, we, we have to send text messages to a particular number and the robot will move accordingly. Uh, that was all features included in the robot. For the machine learning part, I used the uh, OpenCV and uh, for controlling the robot through WhatsApp, uh, a third party service called uh, Twilio was used. And for Discord control, uh, Discord itself has uh, that bot system or bot uh, application. So using that Discord coding was actually very easy. WhatsApp was a little bit more difficult because they had end-to-end -end encryption and also I had to use a business account and things like that for tracking. The face tracking part, actually it was easier to code than the hand tracking. So face tracking worked really well, but the hand tracking part, it uh, sometimes it had some problems, but it, it worked, but it had some problems. So I will show a, a small, uh, this is the photo of the robot uh, during the presentation, uh, the, the exhibition I had at my school. Uh, I won first prize for the, uh, exhibition actually that made me really happy so i will show a small uh, video montage of the robot working
So that was the video. Here is another small video of the robot just maintaining things track. And uh, I was accepted since I won first prize at school. I was actually accepted into district level exhibition also. So in India, robots are not uh, actually that common, especially in my in the uh, South India, in the part where I come from. So they were really impressed with the face tracking concept and all, and also controlling the robots with WhatsApp. So uh, luckily, I also won uh, first prize in the district competition also. So that was uh, that was a really uh, happy point in my life. Um, I, am, I want to build even more uh, robots with larger budgets and all. Since that, I have been working on my next project, which is a same humanoid robot itself, but on a very larger scale, but it will take uh, so much time. I, I hope that I can present that robot in the next year's uh, Reddit's uh, live presentation like this. So that was the presentation. Uh, thank you. You said you were in high school? Yeah, yeah, I'm in high school, yes. That was I just so good. This that was so yeah, good. I, the rage that I want you to understand good. that, like, I am more impressed by that than by these adults 20 years into their career able to build a robot, right? You are just starting your, your career and your foray into robotics. You should be really proud of, uh, of what you've worked on so far. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. There's so many like little decisions where you can just see really, really smart thinking and like lots of very simple solutions to difficult problems that you've done. And to make that many decisions right on your first attempt for a robot and for a humanoid robot at that is really, really impressive. Seriously, well done. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've been actually interested in robotics since a very, very young age. I think since I was five year old. There was this movie, uh, I, my dad took, to, took me to this movie and since then I've been really fascinated by robots. So even though this was my first robot, uh, the actual robot, I've been thinking this over my head for a very long time actually. So planning all these parts, I think three years, uh, it, I was just uh, fa fascinating in my head. I should build a human robot sometime, I should make uh, these decisions, like uh, I should use a web camera and all that things. And suddenly uh, I was uh, noticed about this call, uh, exhibition my school was conducting and I decided why not make it right now, don't wait for longer. And I suddenly uh, purchased the parts from a local market near my house. So I got all the parts really cheap and I quickly put together a physical model and then began the coding. So that's it. That's the, I'd, I'd like to suggest um, you should have a look to see if there's um, a robotics competition team at a at a school or within your district that's, you know, available to you. Um, because I know there are competitions like the first robotics challenge that are, are available all over the world. Um, and, you you know, you could be a part of a really good team for sure. Um, and it'd be, it's it's a lot it's a lot more fun to build robots with other people than just by yourself. Um, we yeah, all yeah, that. actually, from the place that I come from, they don't actually care about robotics that much. Even my school, uh, they even after I build this robot, they are telling that it is good and all, but still you have to focus on your studies. So yes, as you have said, I I was really searching for robotics communities, and that's how I found this Reddit community, and I. Uh, joined as a member and someone, some moderator suggested me to participate in this presentation. And yeah, I will uh, further search if there are any robotics teams available. Thank you for the suggestion. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with an email on Monday. I'll, I'll send it. Uh, Michael, Chris, back to you. Yeah, um, not many questions from the chat, mostly just uh, people echoing the same sentiment you know it's very impressive work for someone of your age um and uh who knows maybe we'll be back in a few years with you know your next hobby robotics project uh, telling us about that so yeah yeah thank you
Um, well, there's no questions. I think that is uh, today's session wrapped up. Okay. Bye. Then. Yes, thank you very much, Naranj. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for your time and participation today. And uh, again, I would recommend highly sharing on social media. You can share the uh, live streams. They go out immediately after we end the stream. Um, and the links for tomorrow's event will be available again via the subreddit, via the website, um, and are already scheduled on the YouTube now. So we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for the next two final sessions, Autonomous Mobile Robots, with a keynote from Scythe Robotics, who are doing all kinds of uh, fun off-roading robots, bringing autonomy to unstructured outdoor environments, um, and other really cool robots like a giant pneumatic spider that's covered in flowers, um, an autonomous sailboat. Um, and then in the uh, second session, we have a recycling robotics company um, as our keynote, as well as an acrobat robot, a uh, humanoid robot that's about the size of a human, and uh, some really cool touch sensors research. So we look forward yes. to seeing you tomorrow. Um, yep. One, one quick thing before we go, I just wanted to reiterate, you know, thank you so much to our wonderful keynote today, VM, and thank you to all of our presenters, not just for volunteering to present, but for your flexibility today. I know that the timing was a little off. We had some people late or missing, and um, it was really great to just be able to have the wiggle room we needed to work with that. Uh, thanks to everyone being flexible. Yeah. And the social media website that we are operating from is having a moment, to say the least. Yes. Yes, it is. All right. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Hopefully see you tomorrow. All the best.